loud, Karen? Yeah. Uh, please keep yourself on mute. Uh, I can unmute you. Um, I, sorry, I can mute you. I can't actually unmute you. So if you want to ask a question, remember to unmute yourself. And we'll try and wave our arms and carry on to get your attention if you are if you are muted when you start talking. You can also rename yourself if you'd like to. There's a three dots menu at the top right corner of your window if you want to rename yourself. Um, there's also a chat button at the bottom of your screen so you can send private messages to people you know if you want to, or you can share thoughts or questions with the whole group. Um, so you just choose what either everyone or to someone in particular. We'll be recording that chat session at the end. So, um, because there's often some good information and good insights in that, uh, it'll record the public ones, obviously. It is nice if you're able to leave your video on, uh, but we understand that for some of you, uh, internet bandwidth could be an issue. So that's okay. And please don't feel uncomfortable about getting up and having a stretch and moving around. Um, it's not fun sitting for a long time for some of us. Um, so that's okay. When it comes to asking questions, when we have the question times, you can physically raise your hand, uh, but it's a bit easy for that to be missed. So uh, if you go to the bottom and there's a reaction button, the bottom menu, and there's a raise hand icon there. So if you use that to ask a question, you want, you're far more likely to be seen. That will come up at the forefront of the view for us as hosts. I've just put it onto um, a different view for us all. Um, okay, so I'll just a brief acknowledgement to country. In the spirit of reconciliation, and because we're joining today from a range of places, Southern New England Land Care wishes to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea, and community. We pay our respect to their elders, past, present and future, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. In particular, I'd like to recognise the Anawan Nation, who are custodians of the land at Lana and the surrounding region. I'd also like to acknowledge that this event was initially intended to mark the beginning of the 30 year anniversaries for Southern New England land care. Uh, Balala Brushgrove Landcare Group and Lana were, were all fairly instrumental in the early days of Southern New England Landcare. Unfortunately, due to COVID, <laughs> um, though we haven't been able to properly celebrate that and hopefully once COVID eases a little, that'll be more possible. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that anniversary. I really hope you enjoy the information presented this morning. I'm really happy to have a connection myself with Lana and the work that Tim, Judy and Mark have done there. That's both through my own research work that was inspired by Judy and Christine Jones, but more recently working along with Mark and Emerging Natural Capital Accounting. Lana is a really beautiful property and it's impressive what Tim has done there over the years. And it's, it's an example of a grazing business that works wonderfully with nature to successfully integrate low impact livestock production and a resilient business alongside the preservation and regeneration of the natural environment. And I'm pretty sure these are all explicit goals for Tim and his family. I'll hand over to Judy in a moment. And Judy's going to talk about principles and practices behind holistic grazing management. And there'll be opportunities for questions directly to Judy at the end of her session. Tim will then talk about his approach to management at Lana and including his experiences um, coming during and coming out of drought in recent decades. This event is made possible by a, a uh, land care grant uh, that was aimed at mustering members for climate change challenges. So those periods of drought and extreme weather are likely to be more common going forward. Uh, and hopefully some of the insights that Tim presents are helpful to people. And again, there'll be some time for questions after Tim's sessions, session. We'll then have a short break after Tim speaks so you can grab a cuppa um, if you need to. And then Mark Gardner will speak about how natural capital accounting can be applied to the management of your farm business. And there'll be time again for questions of Mark before we then show a few short clips of Lana that Tim's taken. And Karen will facilitate a short session where you can share your thoughts with others in a breakout group. And then we'll have a final session for some more general questions of all three speakers. So I hope you enjoy the webinar and I'm going to hand over to Judy who should be able to share her screen. Thanks, Judy. Thank you, Rachel. First, I'll unmute. Just bear with me. I'm a bit slow with this um, technology. <laughs> I'll mute. Okay. Um, sorry? I'll mute. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I'm good to go? 
Okay, <laughs> excellent. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you, Rachel. Thanks to you, Karen, um, Alex and Struan, all at Southern New England Land Care for all the organization that have, has gone into the various iterations of this event. Um, we're finally here, <laughs> which, which took a while. Um, and thanks to everybody that's joining us um, here today. So um, to get into the, the topic of the day, um, I guess my mantra for some time now has been strongly influenced by people such as Tim, um, has been that grazing livestock are the most important tool that we have as graziers to regenerate land. It's uh, certainly one of the basic tenets of holistic planned grazing. Um, and um, I would suggest that uh, holistic management and specifically holistic planned grazing is probably amongst the earliest of practices that were considered to be classified as regenerative grazing. And of course, Tim was among the earliest adopters of holistic planned grazing in Australia. So I'll be leaving Tim to tell his story. Um, so the focus of uh, my presentation today is really um, to be focused on the, on the principles of um, and practice of uh, holistic grazing management. So um, holistic grazing acknowledges the three components of the grazing ecosystem to be the soils, the plants and the grazing animals. So all of these components um, have evolved over millions of years to function perfectly well um, without necessarily needing any crutches in terms of um, synthetic fertilizers, for example. And all of those elements are completely interdependent. So the key to soil health is maximizing photosynthesis and root biomass to support soil processes. The plants depend on optimal soil health and conditions for maximum growth and production. Animal production, of course, is determined by plant growth and pasture production. But the animals through their grazing patterns impact on the growth and the conditions of the plants, which obviously influences soil health. So there's, there's still quite a few people out there that see conservation and production as being mutually exclusive, but nothing could be further from the truth. Um, and obviously Lana is a, is a great example, but productivity can't be optimized where those ecosystem processes are not functioning to their potential. So in holistic management, um, we recognize four key ecosystem processes. They are the water cycle, the mineral cycle, uh, energy flow and community, community dynamics. And the health and function of all of these are, are intimately related to soil health. And holistic management uses the analogy of the four ecosystem processes as being akin to looking through a different window into the same room. So the, the view is slightly different depending on the angle that you take, but you're pretty much looking at the same picture from whichever window you're looking through. And like soils and plants and livestock, the four processes really depend on the effective function of all the others to, um, to work optimally. So, you know, I think this is a pretty bland slide, but in terms of how it looks uh, in more realistic terms, um, it looks a lot like this area of Lana uh, on Ramallah Creek. Um, and the majority of Lana for that matter. Um, but here you can see beautifully the effects of an effectively functioning grassland ecosystem. You know, a, a clear flowing creek, um, optimal species diversity, actively growing plants, which are supporting an active mineral cycle. So my plan this morning is to spend a couple of minutes on each of these processes and then to talk um, more, a little bit of it, at least about the, um, practices to enhance the function. So let's start with the water cycle. Um, this is obviously not Lana. Um, it's a fence line from uh, a property, uh, or two properties, in fact, um, down near Wallabadar, which is south of Tamworth. Um, and it was taken towards the end of the drought in 2019 after a 16 millimetre rainfall event. But it shows perfectly the paramount importance of having ground cover and, and also more, more importantly, plant cover 
in promoting soil water infiltration. So we really need to work to stop the movement of water across the soil surface and maintaining 100% ground cover 100% of the time has to be the goal. And, and certainly around the uh, New England um, Northern Tablelands region. So when we've got um, a higher density of plants that slows the mo movement of water across the soil surface, but more importantly, when we've got plants that are supported by deep robust root systems, those roots and the associated um, biology that grow deep into the soil profile, they enhance soil water infiltration and therefore enhance the water cycle. Oh, what happened? It's not. What happened? I've, I've got a problem with, um, with moving slides on. Sorry, Rachel. Is there something sitting on your keyboard somewhere? Do you want to stop sharing? No, there's nothing sitting on my keyboard. Just um, how's that? Did that work? No, I'm seeing you. Do you want me to share mine? Oh, okay. Um, perhaps that might be necessary. Yeah. Okay. Don't know what happened. It just... Um, just give me a moment. Just stop. So we need to go to slide five. Yeah. I'll just have a moment to open it. Um, Oops. Now I've lost everything. <laughs> Slide five? Yeah. Uh, hang on, slide. That's the one. I'll just go forward. Um, getting there? Okay. <laughs> right, is that working for you? Uh, yeah, I'm seeing... Um, I'm seeing the whole range of slides. Is that? I don't know why it's doing that. Uh, swap displays. That's better. Uh, I'm seeing it. Okay. I don't know how other people are seeing it. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> We've got the thumbs up. Okay. We'll carry on. Sorry. <laughs> don't know what happened there at all. Um, anyway, so. This is one of my favorite slides. Um, basically, it shows that uh, different plants have um, different root architecture. And of course, those different plants are going to support a different suite of soil organisms, which obviously adds to the diversity within the soil system. Um, so the root system, as, as it extends into the soil with the associated biology that modifies the soil system which effectively increases the porosity, the airspace in the soil, improves soil structure, thereby enhancing soil water infiltration and the water holding capacity of that soil. So we improve soil conditions, starting with improving the condition of the plants that are growing on that, um, on that, um, on that soil. And of course, as the soil system improves, it actually increases the capacity for further improvement in that environment. Um, next slide, please, Rach. Should be coming. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yep, that's the one. Yeah. It's it's a it's an oldie but a goodie. Um, I think it's um it's worth reminding people that with perennial grasses, what you see in terms of plant biomass above the ground is reflected in the root biomass below the ground. So when you've got short grass plants, they are going to be supported by a relatively sh short and small root system. And the taller plants are going to be supported more generally by much more robust and deeper root systems. So there's often a debate about whether a particular species has got short or long roots. Um, and to my mind, it's a bit of a nonsense really, because when you look at most grass plants, the capacity for root growth by plants really depends on the soil conditions and the management of the above ground parts. So regenerative agriculture as a, as a movement uh, has a really strong focus on building soil health. But given most of the soil is below the soil surface, it's really hard to manage what you can't see. But this feature of perennial grasses if you remember that um, going forward, you'll have a pretty good idea of what's happening in your soil in terms of individual plants. Thanks, Rachel. 
So the next one is the mineral cycle. And the mineral cycle is driven by all of the critters that reside predominantly in, but also on your soil. We need to consider these guys as, um, as basically your below ground livestock. Really start to treat them and nurture them as you would your livestock or, or as a workforce. The potential diversity of soil organisms is immeasurable. And in terms of the actual biomass of soil organisms in the soil, if you've got a healthy soil, the stocking rate equivalent in DSEs um, of the soil biota will be something like 10 times the number of DSE that you're running on the soil surface in terms of sheep and cattle and the like. So the potential carrying capacity below the soil is, is quite uh, significant. And basically there's a vast number of these organisms that are literally screaming out to get to work for you. And all that they need is, um, is the right working conditions. That's really what they're, they're looking for. And that's primarily in the form of plant roots. So around about 70% of the biomass of soil biota is associated with the plant roots in the rhizosphere. Next one, Rach, please. So Ian and Di Haggerty um, provide a really lovely example um, of how you want your plant roots to look. Um, and as Nicole Masters uh, refers to them, she calls them Rastafarian roots. So having that dreadlock look on, uh, on plant root systems is really ideal. So that's really what you're looking at there is a massive soil biology associated intimately with those plant roots. So the more plant root biomass you have present in the soil, the more soil biology is gonna be supported. Obviously more biology is going to promote soil water infiltration and soil water and the, and the holding capacity of that, that water. Um, so, and the soil water is so important for soil biology to thrive and also enhance plant growth. So next one, sorry, Raj. Yeah. So I'm sure that most of the people that are, are on today would have seen this soil food web slide at least a dozen times. Um, but if you haven't, um, it's a really nice, simple illustration of the soil food web and the processes that occur, which is essentially akin to um, mineral cycling. And the point of including it right here is to emphasize that it all starts with the capture of sunlight energy and the conversion of that energy into plant material or organic matter. So the bigger the base that we've got, that is the more growing green plants and the more root biomass, the bigger or the more total organic matter that is going to be present and the greater the potential capacity of that soil food web. And it's those processes from one level to the other that actually drives mineral cycling. Next one, please, Rach. Excuse me. Which leads us, leads us to energy flow, which also basically starts with the capture of sunlight energy and the conversion of that energy into sugars by plants via photosynthesis. So um, energy flow essentially refers to the flow of energy through the system. So energy is lost at each step and recreated in different forms. So as an example, um, for on the average New England property, this is some um, excluding Lana from, from, from the average, um, but uh, the average New England property, about half of 1% of the total sunlight energy that hits the surface of the, um, of the earth is converted, into plant bio, is converted into plant biomass. So when you consider that 50% of that biomass is above the ground and 50% is below, it's a, it's a fairly low conversion rate. And then if we consider a 10% feed conversion efficiency by livestock of that uh, green feed, 10% um, is considered a pretty good um, feed, con feed conversion efficiency. So we can take small steps um, 
for, for small gains in energy conversion efficiency, but they'll have huge consequences in terms of production. Um, and the, really the, the key is more green plants with more growth, more diversity, and more plants per unit area, um, which is the basis of, um, of any primary production and particularly grazing enterprise. Next one, please, Rach. Trying. Okay. Oh, no, no, yep. Maybe it's not me. <laughs> okay. I know why that was. <laughs> okay. So, um, one of the most effective ways to uh, increase energy flow is to increase the diversity of species that are growing there. So, species with different growth cycles. So, the cool season, warm season plants, um, plants with different growth habits. And this particular slide shows a, a number of uh, different plants with, with different habits. So you've got the, the native glycines. There's two species of glycine in the shot that have got that twining habit. Um, there's at least four different species of perennial grasses there um, and a couple of little sedges that are easily identified. So different functional groups, different families, such as the broadleaves, which are very often and commonly referred to as weeds. They have significant roles in adding diversity and adding to community dynamics. So you've got the legumes, the salt bushes, the brassicas, and of course the grasses, they all contribute to community dynamics. That's aside from the um, community dynamics that, that are going on in the soil. But this is also the basis of um, the latest fad that we're, we're seeing these days in, in multi-species cropping, um, which um, um, the concept of multi-species cropping and grazing is fantastic. But you know, when I was monitoring pastures at Lana, which was some time ago now, um, I recorded on average 20 individual species growing in an area that was a quarter of a metre squared. So, which is, which is quite phenomenal. Um, and so I guess the point is that it's there naturally and, and Tim certainly is seeing it um, happening across the whole property. It's there naturally if we take the time with management, um, appropriate and sympathetic management, holistic management, to actually nurture it and, uh, and allow it to express. So the diversity of predominantly native grasses um, and forbs on Lana is quite phenomenal. And you just can't buy that in a bag. Um, but it's, it's really a, about managing the grazing to actually achieve those outcomes. And as I mentioned, you know, different species and families of plants will have different growth patterns, different root architecture, and they'll support different communities of soil biota. So it's a, it's a whole system. Next one, thanks, Rach. So effective um, ecosystem function really starts with soil health and perennial grassroots are the best soil conditioners going. So if you increase the root density and the volume of roots and the root biomass, you're naturally going to uh, allow an increase of biological activity in the soil which is going to serve to increase the macro porosity, those soil macro pores that I've mentioned there, uh, on, and the soil structure. And that in turn increases soil water infiltration and soil water holding capacity, which enhances plant growth in terms of the tops and the roots. So effectively going through this cycle, you're, you're building capacity and resilience in the whole landscape. And how well your soil processes function really depends in large part on the management of the above ground processes. And of course, grazing livestock are the primary influence in terms of, of um, that management. Thanks, Rachel. So um, the grazing ecosystem really operates as a feedback loop um, and it can be positive or negative really. Uh, depending on your management. And so holistic planned grazing as it's practiced at Lana, at its core is regenerative grazing. Um, and using those grazing livestock to regenerate ecosystem processes and improve production, the two are inextricably linked. And I'm sure Tim will talk to those uh, elements later. 
But when we start to work with natural processes, those four ecosystem processes in particular, to maximise natural capital, that's going to optimise production. So this slide is a little bit busy, um, but hopefully you can see it's, it's an attempt to summarise the complexity of those soil processes that occur below ground in the grazing ecosystem. But really the key to optimising those processes and the, and the function of those processes is really appropriate utilisation of the above ground material and particularly leaving enough material, enough of a food supply in terms mostly of plant roots to feed all of those below ground livestock so that they can work for you to, to their potential. Thanks, Rachel. So management of um, pastures to optimise plant production, leaf and roots um, is, is really most effectively achieved through managing the grazing livestock. And you really have to keep in mind that uh, the change happens one plant at a time. So it's the interaction between the animal and the individual plants and the effect of that defoliation event on individual plants is the collective effect on, on those plants that actually ultimately manifests in the pasture as a whole. And it really comes down to your management uh, in terms of managing that, that bite process that is really the key to enhancing the, um, the pasture production as a whole. Next one, Rachel, and it might be just worthwhile going through and putting the four points up and oh, yep. um... rather than coaching through okay I'll so, just, uh, hopefully it doesn't go through to the 16th slide oh no there you go okay there's, there's four, four points. points that's it perfect thank you so as complex as the um as the soil ecosystem is um there are four key factors that are really within the control of of management and there's simple pr principles that when put into practice really result in building capacity in the landscape and achieving that improved ecosystem function. So the first of these is the management of the recovery period to ensure plants, but more, more important than the, the leaf. So we, we focus on the leaf recovery, but the recovery of the root systems uh, of those plants is, is probably more important in terms of um, resilience and persistence of, uh, of plants. So we really need to ensure that we're allowing plants adequate time to recover from a previous graze event. And of course, uh, when plants are, are growing slowly or not growing at all, they're going to require a much longer period of time to recover from those previous events. So the second point that we've got control over is the management of the graze period. And the basic principle is to keep that graze period as short as possible, although it's always going to be a function of the time required um, for plants to recover. Um, the third factor, and, and I guess over time, um, I've become more conscious of the importance of leaving a minimum residual herbage mass. And these days, I recommend at least 2000 kilograms of dry matter per hectare. Um, and that basically builds in a drought reserve constantly. So you've always got um, a, a few hundred kilos of um, available pasture up, up your sleeve in case um, the um, conditions are not, uh, are not conducive or as expected. So there are really two elements in terms of maintaining the, re the residual herbage mass. The first principle is that the more you leave behind after, at, at any graze event, the faster the pasture will regrow. Um, and also there'll be less relative, relatively less damage to the, uh, to the root systems. And the second is that you need to actually actively manage to leave something for the livestock below the ground, for the soil livestock. So you need to be thinking about them constantly in terms of um, leaving something for them. Sorry about that. Um, and in the Northern Tablelands, managing for about 50 to 60% utilization on average 
you'll be pretty close to the mark uh, as a in terms of total annual production. The final element that we've got control over really is the number of livestock that we're running. And it's really uh, critical to carry the, the numbers that are appropriate for your carrying capacity. But again, given the increasing variability of our environment, that carrying capacity is like to, likely to be changing very frequently. And of course, there's two elements to that as well, or to numbers as well. Um, there's the, the stocking rate, which generally relates to the whole property and stock density, which um, relates to uh, animals that are taking an amount of herbage mass from any uh, individual paddock at any time or on a daily basis. Last slide, thanks, Rach. Oh, do you want me to... Are there more? Yeah, flip, flick through. I think there's five points. The last one is about planning and monitoring. So, um, so the basic principle is that the more paddocks you make available per mob, the greater the control and flexibility you have over the grazing. And I'm sure that Tim is going to be focusing on that um, in, the, in his presentation in a minute. But basically, the more paddocks you have per mob allows you to manage to actively increase pasture growth and actively manage to improve the condition of those ecosystem processes and build capacity in your landscape. So increasing the number of paddocks per mob allows you to manage, proactively manage the recovery period between graze events. And that provides an advantage to desirable species. Um, it gives you the potential to actually physically use stock density, which I believe is really important uh, in driving positive change in, in the landscape, actually to actively drive change in the vegetation. I think stock density is critical. So it actually, provides the potential to increase pasture growth rate, to safely increase pasture utilisation and the sustainable stocking rate, which obviously is a function of the current capacity. But the critical element in all of that is um, planning and monitoring. Um, so those are just a few of the, the basic principles, um, just with a broad brush. And I'm sure that Tim We'll go into much more detail in terms of what he's done on Lana and what he's doing on Lana and the results that he's achieved using these basic principles of holistic plan grazing. Thank you, and I apologise for the technical difficulties. It's always got to be a first time. <laughs> Thank you, Judy. Um, I'm not sure what my screen, my screen's looking odd now. Uh, that. I should. Oh no, I won't mute myself because there, there could be questions. I've got to find Zoom now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Judy. Yes, we've got a few minutes or a couple of minutes. If anyone would like to ask a question, um, perhaps raise your hand using the chat. The reactions at the bottom is the easiest, I think. And if not, we can go on to Tim, and there'll be plenty of time. There'll be time for questions of Judy later as well. So. Cool. I can't see any questions. Karen, can you see any? Hello, Rachel. Can you oh, hear me? Yep, yep. Go, Gordon. Um, you mentioned, Judy, you mentioned um, about um, grazing systems having evolved over many years with plants and animals. I have no issue with that. However, are not the majority of our grazing systems now open systems where we export product? And whereas in the past, those systems that have evolved that we're sort of trying to maybe run in parallel to or learn from, they were closed systems with everything going around and around in circles. So are now we're not exporting product and therefore is there not a case for over time looking very carefully at the um, addition of product might be phosphorus, sulfur, whatever into our um, grazing systems. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good point, Gordon. Um, and, and absolutely, we are exporting product. Um, I guess I would contend that the level of productivity of most of our grasslands has declined significantly. And certainly the, um, the, the general health of our soils has declined significantly with that approach. I, you know, so I think that it's possible to export product. And I, and I think that we've probably got the perfect example here today and what Tim's doing on Lana. 
it is possible to um, have and run such a system without degrading the, the resource base. So I guess my comment originally regarding the soils, plants and grazing animals was that um, they have evolved over time without thinking about production systems per se. But, you know, a lot of the systems these days, we prop up with, um, with the fertilizers, the phosphoruses and the, um, and, and the urea particularly is common out here. Whereas if we actually took a more sympathetic approach to managing the plants so that they could actually utilize the, um, the natural minerals available in the soil, then um, it would be far more sustainable in the long term. Um, looking at the, the total amount of, um, of soil nutrients in most soil tests, you know, the actual available phosphorus and the, and the data set that, that comes to mind is mostly on the North Coast, but about 1% or less than 1% of the total phosphorus pool is, is available. Whereas if we can actually maximize the activity of, um, of the bio, biology, um, particularly to, to stimulate the cycling of, of phosphorus in particular, then um, it would be a much, much more favorable outcome and there'd be far reduced need to be adding that in, uh, in fertilizer. I think also just finally um, that the amount of um, nutrient that is lost in soil moving across the uh, landscape far exceeds that that goes out the gate in, uh, in terms of animal product. Thank you, Judy. That was a great answer. And thanks for the question, Gordon. It's a common question. Um, there will be more time for questions of Judy later. I think we might hand over to Tim now, and I'm just going to share my screen with Tim's presentation. So um, I'll just do that. And just allow me to find the right presentation. <laughs> oh, it is here somewhere. Oh, hang on. Sorry, right. I thought they had it open. Lay from the start. Right, oh, Tim, are you right to go? Yeah, if you can hear me. Yep, good. And um, you just let me know when you want me to move the slide forward. Okay, we're right. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, thank, thanks. Um, uh, welcome to everyone to this to this day, which I. Um, it was frustrating that we couldn't do it in March, but um, <clears throat> anyway, that was that's Mother Nature. And uh, as we look at this slide here in front of our homestead, uh, that's the Rimula Creek, which was in flood big time when uh, just the day before we were meant to start. So, um, so I guess my uh, my journey um, into this area started. Um, Firstly, from my father, I could say, and probably my grandfather, who, who were this sort of way inclined as well, but they didn't really understand the grazing planning side to, to working with nature. But my father made this property a wildlife refuge back in the uh, um, mid, mid 60s, um, after the 65 drought. And he did it to, to try to demonstrate that you can look after your um, your environment as well, your, your farm as well as try you know, make make it um, profitable at the same time, and just to be more, it was an awareness that factor really for people to be aware of just looking after the wildlife. So I'm blessed with the fact that um, he he looked after it, but I'm also blessed from um, a difference in environment compared to say where Gordon is on the eastern side of Urala, where. Uh, because of the, I think largely because of the soil type, the granite, you know, it was regarded as poor country, couldn't run a sheep to the acre on it. Um, and so it wasn't axed as heavily back then. And, and um, when the property Balala was taken up in the early settlers by um, Mawson Turl, the first, and they were some of the first to come into New England, um, they used this country here on Lana as the lambing paddocks. And I think also that was my, another reason why they didn't 
axe the country as hard as what they did further on the eastern side. And so we we're blessed with that. Um, so we've always had a good um, balance of timber, um, except for where our airstrip is or has now been fenced off. But in the father's time, an airstrip was put in uh, when Tiger Moss were introduced to um, put some of the first aerial superphosphate on the property. And that was, you know, that was seen at that time as the as the way forward. And it still is in certain places. I'm not knocking that at all, but it, but it um, and I've always sort of sat on the side with that over the last, over the years. My fertilizer spreader um, is still in the in the in the shed. Well, I haven't used it for a number of years now, but I've been thinking, well, maybe I will have to. Um, and I've just it's basic observation and uh, and test results and seeing what's happening and uh, that sort of led me to where we are now, which is pretty exciting, really. But it takes a while to sort of for this to happen. Um, so okay, can we move on there? Yep. Rachel? I mean, yeah. Yeah, so our next one, we're, most, I think we're on Northern Tablelands, western side yep. of Urala. And so that's sort of a bit of the history there um, of how we started in uh, the aerial application of where the tiger moss we used. And um, that was quite exciting times then. And it did show some, you know, there's no doubt, it, it did have some impact. Um, in those days, um, and it still does in certain areas. But, uh, you know, we've got to look at the cost of, you know, I think it was uh, $20 a tonne or something. I can't recall exactly. Gordon might remember what it was back then, run the early days. Um, but, you know, it's way above that now. And so our cost of production, I guess, is the things which we really got to focus on. And that's where I was heading after the 1980s drought. So, um, which led me to the uh, 90s, early 90s, um, doing a bit of a trial. And that's where Judy and Christine Jones came along to, um, on the, so with the support of uh, Wal Whaley, Professor Whaley from the UNE, who's highly regarded, in, in, particularly in the botanical side. And he was very focused on native pastures and still is. Um, but it led me to sort of think, well, there's got to be another way, another way after the 1980s drought. Um, I'd studied uh, on a Jack College uh, in the, well, the first year through there, and, and it was very focused on silage and haymaking, and, um, but very little on plan grazing. Well, there was actually nothing much on that. It was just um, trial and error grazing, I suppose you could call it, or knee jerk sort of grazing, uh, move when you have to. But not so much as a plan um, and a holistic plan is what Judy was sort of alluding to. Okay, thanks. Next one there, Rachel. Yeah, so the thing which I missed, um, it take, took me a, a while to sort of realise this, um, is that everything we do, and it wasn't that Alan Savory came into Australia and he, and he talked about... Um, uh, making this it's a decision making process and that's really what it, what we're talking about here today um, I made the decision to change it's not necessarily for what for my reasons it wasn't necessarily other people's but I did it purely on the basis of economics and the, the land was so and the fact that it did take five years after the 1980s drought for the land to recover and I'd say at least that time financially as well um, there's a big difference to today, but the, the 95, we had a, a drought period and, and I'll show that on the graph later, the changes and, and what's happened, but it is basically really about decision-making based on cause and effect and um, looking at um, where's the weak link. Uh, the cause and effect is a big one. Um, are we treating the cause? We keep asking ourselves when we walk out the door, are we treating the cause here or are we treating the symptom? And yeah, and you try and make a better decision by, based on that. Um, so, and we always monitor. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah, there. Yeah. So, yeah, that's just showing you what we used to how we used to make hay there. That's an oak crop with had woolly pod vetch in it, and um, up near where our airstrip was. And uh, so, just looking at that tractor, you'll see that's just sort of an illegal old girl now. But um, that's how we, what I used to do. And that particular hay, which I made, um, this is after the 80s um, drought in between there, it, it, didn't it didn't last long at 
long at all because uh, yeah, it wasn't long before we you I, I just wasn't making enough anyway for what we were doing. Um, okay, next one. And so this this particular shot, uh, some some people have seen, but it was taken in the 1980 drought and. When you look at it, you'd think, oh, yeah, he took that because of um, I was looking for water. The dams had been cleaned out. Um, but really, the issue there is the bare ground. And I wasn't aware of just how much bare ground I was, I was creating. Um, and I've got another, another one. Uh, thanks, Rachel. Of the same shot at the height of the 2000 and, um, yeah, in, uh, 90, yeah, 2020, um, that was just before, at the end of the spring, coming into summer when it was really dry. And that's the same photograph. And what I've got there is a solar pump on that, that particular dam. And um, then I pump, so I pump into the, the amount of water there is, is because I pump from with another solar pump from the rim of the creek to there. And that's how I get it. Then I take it up to a high point, the highest point of the highest points, and then it gravitates um, five different directions. So there's no uh, petrol and fooling around with little pumps and things anymore. But it just demonstrates the change of thinking uh, for the two different droughts. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Next one. Um, and so with the research that was done with Christine and Judy, it was, it was at the time very challenging sort of um, challenging to do. And I think, you know, uh, I know Judy is, would also be aware as much as Christine how, how quickly it, the land recovered. And, um, and it wasn't until Christine took these photographs because you sort of get used to how the land is. You don't sort of realise what's going on and you just think, oh, yeah, that's the way it is. But when Christine showed me some of these photographs of what they were doing on the transects, and it, this was done over four different sites, four different areas on the property. To, and I had to, to do it properly, I had to have a control and it was very frustrating trying to keep that control and trying to think of the same old way of why I was doing it um, and then move them into another area and then come back and, yeah, with no real grazing plan. But, um, but that's just basically showing the bare ground and a bit of mullein coming in there and, uh, yeah, that fairly unproductive sort of an area. Okay. Next one. And so... The other thing I learned back then was that livestock are our tools. Um, and I wasn't thinking of them as tools so much. It was just something to make some money out of. And, uh, and yeah, and so, you know, we are a um, cattle in front of sheep operation, uh, always lead a follower. And I do it that way because, um, in particular, I started wanting to do it that way because of the barber's pole in the, in the sheep. And I, um, Overcome, I've overcome a lot of that barber's pole issue because the cattle take a lot of that worm burden off as um, as we graze, and then also the a longer grazing um, re recovery rest, rest period or recovery period, and uh, I was working on a, a minimum of, th of three months before I'd come back, and that was sort of laying the litter down, but it was also helping to break that worm burden. So the stock are our tools. And the next one, and that was in the 94, 95, that photo was taken in the drought then. Um, so you can see a fair, fair bit of ground cover still there. So it's all about um, um, avoiding overgrazing. Um, and um, the brittleness scale is something which uh, you, has been, was introduced by uh, Savory and he, from one to 10, and to see where you sit. And, and so, you know, that, that determines, has a big determinant factor in, um, in the amount of re recovery that your land really needs year in, year out. So the further west we go, out towards the centre of Australia, you know, the more brittle you, we become. Um, and so I think we're about a six on the scale out of 10, which means that we are more, more brittle. And so uh, that's why we have a, uh, compared to say Bellingen, and so our recovery period overall is always longer, you know, around that 60 to 110 days. And um, same as what Judy mentioned about retaining um, 
pasture at, at the at the end. Um, I've got fifteen hundred kilograms per hectare, um, but it's merely at the moment uh, we're leaving. We're probably leaving more like four ton behind when we leave, when the stock move out because we've had such a big uh, season uh, in in the autumn winter this year. We um, have gone right through without just without feeding anything and. Um, um, just using Himalayan salt, which I'll talk about later. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, so this is really the the plan, and something when we when we wherever we are in the world, we have you know we have seasonal change, and so if you go to Victoria, that curve is more virtually the upside down. It's the other way around. The bar is upside down um, because of the seasons are, are different in winter, but that's basically. The planning of um, you can see at the bottom where I have a feed buffer, and that's the 1500 uh, at the moment up to four four ton to the uh, left behind to the hectare, and um, and the bigger you can make that, the better I think. The the, the more litter you can lay down, um, the better the, the better better it comes. The better the country responds, and um, yeah, especially after you get a little dry spell. Uh, if you've got a fair bit of litter there, it'll respond very quickly, as it did in this last drought, um, because within a month, and this is a bit mind-blowing, but we did have the odd storm before the rain event in um, January, um, and, and when it did in uh, 2020, but when it did break, within a month, I had uh, cattle on adjustment. I, I'd sent all that, most of our cat, I'd sold most of the cattle, kept the sheep, and fed and didn't feed anything. Um, they just had Himalayan salt and kept them moving. Opened up the paddocks more, not uh, gave more paddocks. What I'm talking about there, not just opened them up. I kept the, everything the same, but just had more area to move, more more recovery time. But that allowed uh, stock to come back on very quickly. And I was inundated with people wanting to bring stock on um, because they were still feeding even next door actually so anyway that's that's sort of showing how how it works roughly the spring summer autumn period and the top in that summer period at the top that's really your hay shed um, the closed plan comes into plan you know coming in uh, around february march um, and i am i'm a big believer of the equinox um, that's when plants naturally shut down and open up again start to work and different plants come in and go so that's the succession part of it as well. But the plan is really um, an important part of the, very important part of the whole uh, whole operation. Okay, next one there. So um, since we've sort of introduced this program, um, there was one thing which um, Stan Parsons is, is now deceased, but. I'm a, I was blessed by the fact that I had both Stan Parsons and Alan Sayre, who did work together in uh, in Zimbabwe before they in South Africa before they came over to America and they had to leave. But um, Stan was more the economist, and Alan's the ecologist, if you want to put it that way. But the two together were really a great team, and I was blessed by the fact. So I'm just passing this message on because Stan. Um, gave this very, he was very upfront and he basically saying that 70 to 80, 60 to 70% of your costs of production are land and labor related. And that's the area which we've got to focus on if we want to survive, um, as well as looking after the land. And so I thought, okay, if it's land and labor, what are we doing? And so it made me start to think, well, why, you know, if I'm, if I'm sowing pastures, making hay, doing all these things and extra labor costs, um, I'm gonna, I just focused on that right the way through, and it's hard, maybe a bit hard to believe, but our indirect costs of production, unfortunately, we don't have much chance, control over our direct costs, such as rates and insurances. But those indirect costs, um, such as drenching and everything else that goes along with that, have been reduced by around 70%. And, and it's very, you know, like it's hard to, to, for some people to believe that that can happen, but it, and I certainly didn't think it would happen when Stan pointed it out, but it is happening. Um, so I'm not doing a lot of the stuff that, uh, and particularly labor, the big, big cost. And if we use labor now, it's only a contract and that's it. 
uh, in terms of shearing and um, landmarking, and which I'm doing this afternoon. So anyway, that's it. Thanks, Rachel. So the map, as you see there, is similar to what we've got. I've got here. Um, it's the same map, but it's just more paddocks than what what was what you were looking at. There's three. We can't see 300. your Tim. Tim, we can't see. Sorry? We can only see the screen. We can't see your map behind you. Just the screen. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, that's good. I won't go because of the glare, probably. <laughs> but um, what I do is um, I've divided it up into eight farmlets what I call farmlets. Um, I'm not really a fan of the word sell because um, we're farm managers. We're not sell, sell managers. Um, but I, I just, yeah. So I've broken it up now into eight and, and the one down on the bottom left-hand corner is split in half. So that's the extra one because that was the worst country and it's now produ producing a, no, as better, if not better now than the front country, which had been ploughed and sown, even though it was... A, you ploughed with a chisel plough, it still upset the granite country here. And that was some of the worst country to get back into, into shape. Um, so that's how we do it. And, and during the drought, um, the middle, the brown one, uh, that was the area which I um, destocked first. And that the sort of the boundary between them opened up, if you can imagine that. Um, so, 10 paddocks go one way, another 10 or 15 go another. And, and I, then I started, yeah. So in other words, as soon as you start to play games with that sort of thing, you can you can increase your recovery phase by an extra month at least. And um, so you adjust your stocking rate first to, that suits your carrying capacity. The carrying capacity was getting less. And uh, that's the way we sort of came through. Um, and so, I was able to, that's the way we were able to come through without having to um, feed any any hay and grain at all. But sure, we were down in numbers on the cattle, but I'm not worried because we've got more cattle now than we had then at the start of the drought in terms of adjustment and people still wanting to bring them on. Now, the reason I see, the way I see it is the reason why people want to bring them, are happy to keep them on is because I've got a grazing plan. I've got a plan that I can say, well, you can, these stock can stay here for at least a year. They're not just having a paddock. They can stay for a year, maybe two. Um, and this is what, what, how we do it. And, and they know that the stock are going to be looked at every, uh, twice a week. That's how we do it. Uh, they moved every three to four days, depending on, on the season. And um, yeah, and they do very well. So, so that's... Um, that's what's happened there. Uh, and the average uh, hectares um, is 10. We're down to 10 hectares per paddock now. And the area that's the, um, which isn't showing on, on this, on that map there, but there's one area where I went, where I went down to four hectares. And what made me do that was I had, I was on a visit to South Africa and I saw a guy over there called Ian Mitchell Innes, um, who's been, one, he was one of the first in the world, I guess. He was one of Alan Savory's sort of early, early adopters, and he he he, uh, he now flies all around the world talking about this sort, sort of thing, particularly in America. But Ian, his property is a bit like out the back of um, Byrock somewhere, very hard um, on the eastern side of um, uh, Johannesburg and dry dry environment, but. Walking onto his property, and I was blessed to be able to do that. It was like walking into a, an oasis in terms of um, biodiversity, and it was like walking on, a, on on your bed. It was soft. It was easy to walk on, and so I th and he did that by by higher density. And I was not very game to go high density stocking, but I thought, well, I'll give this a go a bit more. So when I came back, I halved the paddocks again three times. And I came down to that three to four hectares. And that particular area where I've done it, or there's two areas now, it is three times the carrying capacity, which it is, it is challenging. And I know Gordon, you might be you're listening to this, you'll be thinking, how the hell does that happen? Um, but it's really biological. Um, that's, that's the only answer. There's something which I was never taught. Uh, I was taught lots of other things in terms of uh, ag science, but not really biology but uh, the mycorrhizal fungi are really kicking in big time 
the dung pats are going down quick. There's a high, it's a bit like your, um, your holding paddock of your sheepyards. You know, that's really what we're doing, creating that sort of thinking, creating that sort of effect. And also the root mass going down deeper, the roots. The more, they're going down deeper because of the recovery phase, which is allowing them to tap into nutrients, which I don't think they've been allowed to do for many years. So there's a combination of things there. So, but anyway, it's worked and um, that's it. We'll move on. And this is, uh, this is our back country uh, right out the very back, which has had no, no superphosphate uh, um, in, that I can look at, remember in uh, all my father's records and whatever, but it's just showing the, the effect of dandelions um, and people see weeds as a problem. And um, one particular agronomist was with me one day and when I was looking at what to do, and he said, oh, you know, you've got, to, you've got to put a lot more lime out because it's acid and sure the soil is acid, but the, a lot of the native grasses, um, it, it, you know, we'll be talking about acid, that was, it was uh, close on six on the, on the pH scale, but it's now six, around 6.5. Um, but the dandelions, they, the sheep have gone through and they've, they've grazed, they've taken all the heads off of those dandelions. And it's just showing that they are of value. That's the Forbes, um, plantain, dandelion, and a whole lot of other things. Um, but they, they are of value. And um, that was sort of the early stage of, um, of succession in that particular area. And now there's a lot of um, microlina all through there now. Okay. So this photo is just showing the photo effects that Christine uh, and Judy took back in the days of, um, of that early trial work. And mind blowing when you look at that, they were taken on the same day, and you, there's the before and after effect, particularly on the right hand side. Uh, the left hand side had just had a storm, and so that's sort of showing, showing a, a bit of green, but uh, the amount of uh, bulk that's on that um, one on the right is, is largely due to that grazing plan. Okay. And the bare ground on the left. So this is always the challenging one. Um, when, that, when I saw that graph um, that Christine and Judy put up, I thought, no, nah, that doesn't look right. Like how, how could um, phosphorus go up like that? And how could calcium do that? And, and it's still debatable, it, it, you know, uh, um, but the way I see it now, I think it is a lot of that change was happening due to the roots just going down uh, deeper and also the and and the fact that we were allowing so they were tapping into nutrients where particularly on the sheep camps uh, even though this wasn't done on a sheep camp but it was it was in the it was an average of the paddock but the sheep camps I, I what I did was make the whole property like sheep camps um, and that goes back to um, a research scientist uh, the late uh, Jack Hilder at CSIRO and he did a he did work on old established sheep camps and he found that there was a huge amount 10 times the amount of nutrients on sheep camps compared to the river flats of Tamworth and that sort of twigged something to me and it does to most people I think well you know if we had that everywhere what are we doing and so I I, I that comes back to how I fenced the property and so it's not designed according to a to um, any sort of thing in the book or whatever, any plan, it was designed according to the landscape, how I wanted it to be, which meant I had to change different fences um, in, in the, in, um, you know, so, so the stock could move better through gateways and that sort of thing, but it was well worth it. And extra poly pipe was needed to, um, to water they, these areas, um, but, it, but it meant that the, the stock were moving down off those hills, off those conventional um, sheep camp areas, and they were grazing lower and, um, and dunging and whatever, you know, on those higher points. And so, and, and the smaller the paddocks became, the better it was working. Um, so there's a combination of things there, but the mycorrhizal of fungi, are, are, I think have a big role to play in this as well. Um, but at the moment, I certainly don't, think I need to add any any extra nutrients and that will come back to Mark uh, Gardner when he talks about the natural capital accounting side to this um, 
as to where we're at and, and we're actually putting more carbon back than than we're taking off and that's been been proven now okay uh, Tim we're a little bit over halfway through the slides but you've got 10 minutes left so just just might need all right to a little bit quicker for the last we'll flip through um, okay a quick one um, Judy had a photo of the water um, that that this is next door on the left after a downpour in the middle of the drought and that's Lana on the right just showing the effect or how you can improve that water cycle and that's the reason why we were able to put stock back on very quickly you can see the amount of grass that's left there in the height of the drought okay 90 percent of that water was gone on the neighbor side so going on that a one percent increase in in uh, soil carbon uh, leads to 168,000 uh, litres more water um, and that's a big has a big part in the CO2 as well. Um, so we can talk about that a bit more about the water cycle and what we're doing there. Thanks, Rachel. Um, okay. So that's just a bit about yeah, what I've done with the water uh, system. There's the solar pump on the right on that dam pumping up to um, this tank. I mainly took that photo because I've got a uh, a gadget on the called UC, U-SWE, solar powered, and it goes direct to the satellite. And I can pick that up now with Telstra on my phone. And you can be anywhere in the world and you can see what, what level your tank supply is, which is brilliant and uh, great technology. Okay. In terms of troughs. So I'm just showing um, in the recovery phase, that's also glycine. Um, native clover growing in through the, the litter of native pasture there. That's um, um, taken taken in uh, in the autumn period as, as the summer grasses were breaking down. Okay. Next one. Have we got not? Yeah. Um, so th th this was taken in uh, in March. And this is showing the huge bulk. You can tell it's here by the quad bike sitting there and all that huge amount of grass sitting there. Um, Capellopedium on the right, which is a fairly, fairly rare uh, native grass and it's coming in, it's a summer perennial. Uh, but the main thing with this, these two photos is the, is the warm season, cool season perenniality of, of your landscape. And that's something which was, you know, to have faith in mother nature and, you know, whichever, whichever way you want to look at it and say, well, you know, if we look after it, it will look after you. She will look after you. Um, and that's exactly what's happening there. You can see the diversity of species, the huge amount of feed. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we're still leaving at least three to four tonne uh, behind after the stock move out, move on. Okay. Next. Uh, so this is one. Uh, parasitic wasp, um, Rachel can talk about this a little bit more, but she did the early work here um, looking at the uh, relationship of, between ground cover and insect life. And very, it's great work that she did there, Rachel. And I think it, uh, um, it's just showing how important the insects are to, to a plant grazing and, and the benefits that flow from, from that. It's another area we could go into because it's really... Um, particularly in terms of fly, fly larva population, um, Christmas beetles, the things that, uh, you know, how they can, you know, we don't have the dieback issue. And I think the die, maybe the, that, the parasitic wasp has a fair bit to do with that. So the more ground cover we have, the more insect life and the better it works. So, yep, next one. Um, so that's the Rumala Creek again, and on the left and uh, another, tributary Molong Creek coming through on the right, but it's just showing the, the um, which has platypus and bell's turtle, which are highly, very, very rare. Um, there's some work being done on the bell's turtle being monitored right at the moment. They've got cameras on those, some of those trees and a few spots watching to see what's happening there. Um, but it's an indication of a ripe, healthy riparian area. Uh, so there's no erosion and um, yeah, clean water, okay. Next one, um, yeah, with the minerals, uh, we've got to work on the concept of supplementation, <clears throat> not substitution. So if we're feeding hay and grain, um, unless we're sort of in a feedlot situation, um, 
if we can plan the grazing so you have grass ahead, this is during the drought this photo was taken, um, at the start of the drought period, and I have drylick, which is um, um, bypass protein of um, cottonseed meal mainly, uh, sunflower meal, that sort of thing. And so they just get, they might cow, calf unit might eat uh, approximately um, maybe half a cup full a day. That's all they need. And it just uh, um, helps them break down the dry litter that's there, the dry grass. And, uh, and that's it. And I'll, that go, I'll pull that around with a quad bike as we go and you just take a bag with you. So, um, and also the Himalayan rock salt, there's a little little pink salt uh, you can just see there, but that's sort of added, that's the main thing I use now because I don't I don't need the, um, the dry lick because it's not needed. It's only when you get really dry time that that's ne needed and it's very cheap to do. So, okay, next one. So this is just showing, <clears throat> um, this is a really important graph because it's showing the start from 1980, the, the change of thinking and, and where we've ended up. And sure, right now, the, the, the big drought that, uh, that we've just been through, you can see the, dr <clears throat> the dramatic change in stocking rate, um, which in the red line, but the rainfall is the difference. And so where, where you can see, if you look at 94 during that period there, and the stocking rate went up, and but most of that stocking rate was in adjustment. And I had adjustment stock come in from Queensland, uh, Brahman cross cattle, because they're good grazers, you know, they're browsers. They, they, they graze differently to the Hereford and the, you know, the British breeds. And I used them to bash down that old spear grass and rubbish that was not rubbish, but they, they littered it up and they did a good job. And then, then I off, offloaded them. You can see the drop in the, in the graph there uh, in 94. And then uh, maintained again um, uh, with numbers. So, but right the way through to the 2002 drought, and you can see the gap between the rainfall and the stocking rate. No hay or grain was fed there. No hay or grain has been fed since 1980. Um, and so you can see the change of how we went through, except, and then we get the big drought of um, 2000, from 2017 through to 19. And so I adjusted the stocking rate only just in terms of cattle white back, but we was, and now um, from where that point is now this year, it's right back up to where we were in 2017, the stocking rate. And that's largely um, probably 60% of that is adjustment cattle that have come back on. So I use, the, I, I'm not really locked into the breeding game anymore. Um, it, I think, but but I am in the sheep because yeah, there's more involved in the sheep. But the, with the cattle, they come and go according to the season, and you know, I'm not locked in. Okay. So that's the that's what that's the showing the change over the years. Thanks, Rachel. Now this machine, I put it in. It's it's now for sale. I don't. I bought it when I was looking at. This is at the end of the. Drought. I was going to do some pasture cropping. Um, I was sort of keen, thinking that I might be able to post drought fast track a couple of paddocks which had been sown in my father's time and they were harder to get going. Um, they always have been. I thought if I use some tropicals and that sort of thing with it um, um, and undersow it with, um, yeah, oversow it, I mean, with a, with, with a crop of barley or oats. Or, and anyway, all that worked. It broke even. But when I look next door, if we could carry on the next photo. Um, oh. when, I, when you look, when I look next next door, okay, let's go. Um, it, it, I was no better off. Um, I was better. The other paddocks responded just as well. So, so I'm not doing that anymore. But it was just a one-off trial. Um, there's nothing. It was it was worth exercise worthwhile. But um, Mother Nature looked after me again. So just to summarise there. Tim, we've got we'll a couple right of slides to go. So just a couple more minutes and then um, you need to, we'll have some time for questions. You're almost there. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. so um, that's really, I, I have um, got 11 basic principles I work off, which I've you know, been guided by Alan and, uh, and uh, Stan Parsons. But I guess uh, overriding all these principles is, is the value of education. Um, I'm a bit of a stickler on that one. 
<clears throat> I've always believed in education as, as, a, as the way forward. And if it doesn't work, you, you know, move on. You know, you, you assume you could be wrong uh, and you, uh, tomorrow's another day. Don't, you know, don't, just don't carry on the same old, same old if you're not, you know, if you're not sure about where you're heading. Um, so I think the, um, the fact that we, we need to have values and um, well, we all do, but we have, a, have a, a, a goal these days. I talk about a context. I still like the word goal because I think it makes more sense. Um, but matching that stocking rate to suit. I mean, our early days, the stocking rate on Lana was down uh, maybe one sheep to the acre. It's now, you know, th th four times that um, and on average. And it's, you know, it's still, it's still increasing. Uh, so we manage for the range of species, uh, not, not the individual. And I think African lovegrass is a bit of a classic here. It's a big subject. Um, in, on my mind, and I've learned learning now to manage for it. It's just no way I can go out and spray. It's come in, uh, this is the console love grass, and it's come in from wind. Um, the fellow not far away from us sowed it about uh, 10 years ago, uh, uh, under sowed it to a crop of oats, and it's it's everywhere now, not to mention the uh, the, the graders. But it's, um, anyway, the, that's, that's really what we're about, managing for the range of species and uh, working with it. Livestock are our tools. The rest and recovery is a tool. Aim for 100% ground cover. Your grazing plan always has to be flexible. And by that, really, I mean, we, 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 uh, we, we can change from day to day. We, it, there's no hard and fast rule about this one. You've got to be flexible with it. And um, when you walk out the door, you think, oh, gee, things aren't quite as good. So you adjust your grazing plan and away you go. Um, and always have good, clean flowing water. Um, I'm more in time now to think of uh, troughing rather than rather than uh, dams. We still have a lot of dams, about 50 of them, uh, which were all nearly all empty during the drought. Uh, they all been cleaned out, a grand expense, but uh, the troughs is what take, that took us through. Um, think of supplementation. Um, rather than substitution, uh, the mineral lick and salt. Um, that, and I'm talking as Himalayan salt, which has got 84 minerals. And question what your decisions are against your goals. Um, assume maybe you could be wrong, maybe you're not. Um, it doesn't matter, you just move on. Um, and with this level one, the blink of thinking, a um, bit challenging, but I, I think that what please, what's pleasing to the eye is not necessarily pleasing to the bank account or the bottom line. Uh, if you look across a paddock, you'll think, oh, wow, that looks got a nice green crop, whatever. But underneath it might, it might be hard, bare ground uh, and it might be uh, full of weeds or whatever. So we just got to think of the landscape a bit more differently. And um, yeah, think, think more about um, biodiversity, having more birds, um, more insects, um, and a better lifestyle. That's and that that that'll come out in uh, Mark's talk. I think in terms of uh, the social aspect of farming or being living on the land. Okay. I'm going to stop it there because the last two are pretty much placeholders, and that's a lovely place to stop. And I think it would be good to have uh, open the open the um, meeting up for a couple of questions if anyone's got some before we have a little break just to stretch our legs and grab a cuppa. So. Thanks very much, Tim. That was fabulous. Um, um, Rachel. Can yes. You, Rachel, can you hear me? Yes, can hear you. Is, it's, I will <laughs> give you the opportunity, Gordon. Is there anyone else that has a question? I know your questions are always good, but... Go for it, Gordon. Yeah, go for it, Gordon. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you. Um, two quick questions. What did you reduce your overall stocking rate to by say the end of 2019, which was the worst of the drought. If your normal stocking rate was 20,000, did you get down to 5,000 or whatever DSEs? And over that drought period, uh, particularly in um, 18, 19 and 20, what was your actual financial situation using this form of management, uh, particularly taking it into consideration um, that you obviously had cap fairly large capital sales of livestock 
but now have replaced them using adjustment, which is to me a very smart move. Thank you. Yeah, the, well, well um, the stocking rate, you know, you can see it did drop. So um, like we we're sort of averaging around uh, before, around 18,000 DC. Um, I could go up to 20, 22, 24,000 if I really wanted to, but you know, it, it, it doesn't suit me. I like, I like, I'm always understocked. That's the first thing. So you've always got a buffer by being understocked rather than pushing the barrow. If you can do that, well and good. And I'm, I'm a bit of a stickler for quality before quantity. So always aim for higher, higher quality and better stock. So I was down to 6,000 approximately DSC um, without feeding. And uh, that got us through the adjustment. Um, um, like at any time in a drought, there's after a drought, there's always a tight time. So uh, I think the main thing with that point is, is that I wasn't using the the um, the the the, the, per, the the returns from the sale of the stock to go and buy more feed. I was actually using that to put in better water infrastructure. Um, I was putting in more poly pipe and more troughing. That was the main thing. Um, and also the federal, the state government were allowing, as you know, they were putting in. Um, they allowed us to, you know, have a have a, a rebate for, for that sort of. Thing that sort of thing so that was an, a bonus as well so i'm just trying to think the second your second question gordon sorry to take up what was uh, it again? the second question the second question was what was your actual in some actual figures if you've got them financial position did you make a profit taking into consideration selling capital in terms of livestock did you break even did you make a loss um, because that gives people a, a really good handle on how effective your system might be or what parts of your yeah. system they might be able to use. Thank you. Yeah, good. I, yeah, I gotcha. Um, yeah, well, that showed up to be, we, we actually made a profit. We were profitable. Um, it did show up uh, and the bank accounts uh, show that. And that that was also, that's also there for the natural capital accounting um, data through our account, but my account was, you know, but I was blown away. You just couldn't believe that we were in that position, but it was because I wasn't borrowing, um, it, it did borrow to, to, to buy hay or grain at a big expense. Um, so yeah, we were, we were sure, sure the return um, per hectare or whatever is lower than what it is in a good season, but that's, that's, that's what we planned for. Um, but now we were profitable and, um, uh, yeah, I'm very happy with the fact that I could come out at the end of this drought um, without without being indebted to the bank. That's and that's where I was in the 1980s. You know, well, I took five years to recover financially. So, um, so it's a good point, though, Gordon. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. Um, we've got. I can see Richard Doherty has a question, and then we'll go to a break after Richard's question. So you have to unmute yourself, Richard. Hello, Tim. Tim. Hello, Richard. Um, and everyone, thank you. Um, Tim, with regards, those earlier figures, and I don't know whether Judy would be able to, and Rachel, having had a look at them and gone through them on the on um, the graph figures of phosphorus and calcium. Forget those, but have you got more recent where you've seen on with that plan grazing, whether you've ended up increasing your organic matter in the soil through allowing the whole the principles of it and whether that you know whether that's come back into the equation and you've seen that increase in organic matter in the results yeah it has increased um like at the moment um i'm just trying to look at it here um did, 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 yeah no i've got this more of a comment but it but it, the the um the organic matter is around that five percent mark uh so that's what two 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 and a half three percent organic carbon but um whereas before we were lucky to be two percent one or, you know one or two percent organic matter um on average so but that's across the whole probably over over a good number of years uh, and that's a gradual thing um which is happening but i think in the area i'd i'd, I'd like to uh, as you know, I've been talking about this. Um, I'd like to see more deep soil uh, carbon testing 
done. Um, we, we, we need to focus more in that area as well, because I think that's where a lot of our, our, our soil uh, microbes, you know, that's all where it's sort of happening, but we can't see it, you know. We sort of visualize, we visualize it on top, but underneath, that's where it's all happening. And maybe that organic, you know, their carbon levels down lower, um, far better than what we, we really anticipate as well. But it's um, it has increased, there's no doubt about that. Well, that's good because what it does is, I mean, it, you know, with your, you know, just showing those comparative photographs, um, yeah, that it, it, it the, the organic matter allows for a bit of tilth in the soil, which allows for a bit of more, a hell of a lot more resilience in, in during those, during those times, um, Tim. So, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, that, yeah, and that's a positive. It's a very big positive, and I think that word resilience is really, um, yeah, I was certainly a lot more resilient this time than what we were in the 1980s um, after that yep. after that drought then. And that was, a you know, when you look at the rainfall of 1980 and what compared to what, we, what we've just been through, that wasn't a bad drought. It was, you know, it was actually, we were way more in front in terms of moisture in the 1980s than what we have been through in the, this last one. Thanks, so, Tim. So all the more reason. Thanks, Tim and Richard. I might just go to Helen Webb has a question and then we'll have a break after that. And Thanks, Rachel. Uh, my question was just, Tim, thanks so much for your talk about um, planning for water reticulation. I was sort of encouraging some people to, to you were talking about the concept of troughs and uh, fencing off dams and things. And their comment was, oh, no, that's too hard to keep an eye on the water levels. You can lose the water in the troughs. How, how do you manage that? Uh, well, that's mainly the, the actual keeping up with the water. Uh, first, firstly, uh, if you're dealing with cattle, it's really important to have a, have a, um, um, a good outlet. Like, an, you know, don't have a small small hole in your outlet. You'd want an inch and a quarter, so at least, you know, so to keep up, keep the flow rate going um, for, for cattle. So they come in and go pretty quickly. And, um, but as far as monitoring goes, that, uh, that's where the, each trough isn't monitored. But um, if I did have a, an issue, I've always got a dam as a backup if I need to, or, or a creek or something. If Just say if I were, if you're, if you're not here, if, I, if there's no one here and, and there's a ha, stock had to be moved or you have to go away or something, which is normal daily activity, then I, I just open the gate and I'll make sure I'll leave a gate back in behind. So this, if the stock need, particularly the cattle, sheep aren't an issue so much because they, in this uh, New England country, they get enough, merinos in particular, they get enough moisture from the, from the morning dews um, for a few days, but the cattle, yeah, they can just go back to a dam or something like that. And that's how I did it um, right the way through really. But I had to be more on the ball in the middle of, in the height of the drought. Um, but then uh, in terms of the cattle, but most of those cattle had gone. So uh, it wasn't such an issue. Uh, but right these on. days, that's how I do it, yeah. Thank you, Tim. Helen, Richard and Gordon for those questions and answers. Um, there is, we will just have a break. Um, there is a question from Jen Ringbauer. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Jen, in the chat. Uh, we might come back to that later. And um, yes, I'll just, if everyone can have a, have a break for 10 minutes, we'll be back at 12.15 and then Mark will start then. So just go and stretch your legs and grab a drink and we'll see you at 12.15. Thanks.
Righto. Uh, probably a few people are still off um, back yet, but won't be far away. I think we might get started again. So we've got maximum amount of time for questions because that's probably going to be good towards the end. So Mark, are you ready to go? Yeah, no worries. Right, and you're sharing your screen, but I've got a backup here if we need it. Sounds good to me. Are you able to see that? Yep. Okay. Thanks, so I welcome Mark Gardner, who, um, yes, is gonna talk about natural capital accounting, which uh, some has been done on Lana, which is great. Sure has. Uh, I'll just get this set up. Is that working all right, Rachel? Yeah, that's good. Yep. Okay, no worries. Uh, well, look, thanks everyone. Um, uh, I'm Mark Gardner. I'm a farm management consultant down at Dubbo, and I've been involved with holistic management almost for 30 years now as a holistic management educator. And um, uh, the topic is about natural capital accounting. So um, this is a really new topic. So I must admit I'm a little bit nervous because it can be quite technical. So I'd just like to give an overview to what natural capital accounting is. Uh, and how it can be used. But firstly, I'd like to acknowledge, uh, I work very closely with a, a company called Integrated Futures, uh, which are good friends, uh, as well as uh, we work together in a business sense. And that's Dr. Sue Ogilvie, Danny O'Brien, and your own Dr. Rachel Lawrence. Uh, and we work together to put together some case studies, which were funded by Australian Wool Innovation on how to use natural capital on um, uh, wool growing properties in New South Wales, Victoria and Tasmania. Um, so uh, I'd like to acknowledge what I'm going to talk about has also been contributed to substantially by those folks and also to thank AWI for funding uh, the great idea that we had that we could actually apply natural capital to farming businesses. We're all on a learning journey um, so please don't be thinking that I'm a, a great uh, world-class expert on this stuff. We're all learning together um, but I think what we've learned is that natural capital accounting can be very useful uh, and, and very practical for farm businesses. So the talk today, I'd just like to uh, cover off on these points. Uh, firstly, define what is natural capital accounting. And I'm gonna talk about it at the farm level, um, not catchments or anything like that, specifically at an individual farm level. Why is it important? Uh, how do you measure it and, and how you can use it? And then at the end, uh, we'll just look at some of the case study uh, material that's uh, available that we've done for, um, for Lana. And I'll show you some of the examples there of Lana and perhaps we can talk through that a bit later too, if we've got time. Um, so in terms of kicking off, I think in my mind, it's, it's great to think about a sort of a whole farm and. A whole farm is a business entity in itself. And as we are here, we've got uh, Tim and Suzanne that are part of the people base or the human resources of the farm. And, you know, we can measure their well-being and their satisfaction. Um, we can look at that each year and we can look at trends and see how that's going. Um, we can also look at their produce and we can look at the financial implications of that wool. Um, what it sells for and what it costs. So we can look at the financial resources uh, of their farm too. And of course, we can look at the natural resources. We can look at the, the native grasses and we can look at the water and the trees and the special areas like that riparian area of the vegetation. And when we look at it uh, as a whole business, we can actually look at profit as having those sort of three dimensions, if you like, the, the human capital, uh, the financial and productive uh, production uh, resources and of course the natural resources and in my mind those three put together uh, help define the profit uh, the true profit in the past we found it really hard to actually measure the natural resource condition and I think that's where natural capital comes in we've got elements of it and we we look at parts but looking at the whole uh, condition of the natural resource well that's what natural capital does natural capital accounting so in my very basic way, um, I think it's important that we look at uh, some definitions. Um, and the first thing to understand about what is farm level natural capital? Well, natural capital refers to the resources that farmers manage to benefit their business, their families, 
and for future generations. So it's not just a year by year thing, it's a long term um, um, perspective. Um, it looks at things like the remnant native veg, the productive areas of the farm, such as the pasture areas and the crop areas. It looks at the important riparian areas, the water resources, uh, any agroforestry or environmental planning. So natural capital looks at the whole of the natural resource space. Accounting, well, accounting is the measurement and processing and communication of financial and non-financial information about entities. And when we add them together, natural capital accounting, it's basically the measurement, the processing and communication of information about the natural capital in the farm business. So natural capital accounting provides information about the farm natural capital and resources of the business. And the aim is so that you can actually better manage your farm business by be getting better quality information. In a cartoon sense, this is really uh, natural capital in agriculture. And you can see that there's the, the stream, the water resources and the water cycle. Uh, we've got uh, crop lands, whether they be annual plantings or permanent plantings. Uh, we've got all the machinery related to cropping. Uh, we've got animals, uh, we've got above ground and below ground. And here it's a model, if you like, of a farm uh, business, if you like, the natural resources. And that is what natural capital is about. And it measures the conditions of all these things over time. Well, why is that important to measure? Well, one of the things is that in agriculture, we measure things like assets and liabilities, and that comes through in our balance sheet. Um, and that can be numbers or, or financial value or, or both. And, you know, we look at physical assets like our, our machinery or plant and animals and, and, and land in acres or hectares and maybe how many bales we have or, or grain tons on hand, things like that. Um, we look at uh, financial assets such as cash at bank or debt levels and, and, and we look at net worth. So we've got a good solid um, suite of financial metrics uh, that we measure. Um, we also look at profit and loss on a yearly basis, income minus costs equals profit, and that, that can either be positive or negative. Um, and we do these things financially, typically at the end of the year. And we, your accountant or yourself can do that, usually with a set set of standards. So particularly your accountant uses a set of standards to look at um, value your assets and liabilities and look at your profit and loss and they use these uh, ATO type standards, the tax office. They don't make them up and they don't just create things. There's a prescribed set of standards that are used to create your profit and loss and your balance sheet standards. And I think those standards are really important that everyone uses a prescribed set of standards. So with natural capital, I'd like to think of it as a sort of a new measure of farm performance um, that complements the financial measures, doesn't replace them, gives you new information about the performance of your business from a environmental or the farm's natural capital. And until now, we haven't really comprehensively measured the performance of a farm's natural capital. We've looked at things maybe like ground cover, or we've looked at a transect or a paddock, or we might have looked at some native veg areas or, or some regen or number of species. But what natural capital does is it looks at a whole comprehensive suite. And that's described by this word SIA or the acronym SIA, which is the system of environmental economic accounting. So just as the ATO is a system of the way we should look at our financial performance, the SIA prescribes a way in which we can use and describe our natural capital. So we're fitting into this sort of international system of how we should do it. If we measure the performance of the farm's natural capital, we can now more effectively manage it and get better quality information about how it's going, the health of our important natural resource base. And it does make sense that we measure this health of the main asset, the land, because 80% of the financial asset of a business can be held in the land. And, and it's the way in which we actually derive our profit. 
So it actually makes sense that we should look at the condition of the major resource, which actually creates the profit. Is it getting better over time or is it not getting better over time? And there's many non-financial benefits, <coughs> excuse me, that can be produced from the land, um, which haven't been measured in the past. And I'll talk about some of those in a minute. And some of those measures can actually benefit the individual business, but also the wider community. And some of them may have value and there's new markets opening up for those. <coughs> so it's important that we actually look at um, the condition of the natural resource, not just from a financial perspective, but also from some of those uh, wider business and, and new benefits that are starting to get recognised. Natural capital can be measured in a number of layers, you know, um, fairly simply, and things like carbon footprinting for an enterprise uh, is, is quite simple to do. Then the next level up might be your net farm carbon balance. So you're capturing and storing more carbon than you're emitting. Uh, and, and environmental profit and loss, they can be done as sort of the next level up. And then quite a higher level is a full, natural, full set of natural capital accounts. And that's where someone like Rachel will come out and spend time assessing the farm from a whole range of different perspectives. Uh, and it might involve another, uh, other visiting experts, birdos or soil scientists and, and stuff like that. So natural capital accounting has layers, entry level, medium level, and then that full set of accounts. And of course, the entry level is cheaper. The full set of accounts can be more expensive. Um, internationally accepted ways of measuring things, the SEA um, accounting standards, uh, which are comparable to that sort of financial standards through the Australian tax office. So um, using a, a established criteria. And, at the end of the day, natural capital accounting doesn't replace what you're measuring now in your business. It adds new information that helps you understand better the true profit in your business, financial, and of course, um, what's happening on the resource base. And if you've got any real technical questions of what you measure and how, Rachel uh, is a fantastic resource for you there locally. So in terms of Okay, well, that's the theory, but you know what's actually measured and what, what does it look like? And just as we drill down into some of the case study stuff, this is a typical farm level natural capital report that we've been producing um, from the 11 case studies. Um, and there's six really important areas that we can provide a, a sort of a mini report on to create a whole report. The first uh, top left there is about ecosystem services. And in a full natural capital uh, accounting report, there's 12 criteria that look at ecosystems. And this uh, split into four, uh, three areas, regulating, uh, uh, habitat, and provisioning services. And so you can get a printout on how your, the health of your farm in those 12 criteria. We can look at um, the ecosystem type uh, and its use and, and how many hectares are there and its condition. We can look at environmental profit loss and we use a caring model uh, to look at that. And there's 31 metrics of environmental profit and loss. The caring model is a very, uh, is a model that's used a lot in the wool industry and it's a model that's been peer reviewed and accepted. So we just use that because um, it, it's there and it's existing. The important stuff, which I'll talk about a bit more is about carbon sequestration and emissions. And we can look at, for a wool growing farm, things like um, uh, the carbon dioxide emissions per kilogram of wool, uh, and we can get down to that level. Or we can look at the whole farm carbon balance. Is your farm storing net carbon or is it emitting carbon? Um, we can look at things like long-term ground cover, of course, as, as Judy and Tim have mentioned, that's so important to the water cycle and creating the conditions for regeneration. And we can also look at the capacity, the productive capacity of the ecosystem and, and score uh, that productive capacity ecosystem. So there's six elements of a typical natural capital accounting report. Each of those give you some really valuable information about the condition of your resource base on a whole farm basis, very comprehensive. Um, so how do you use these uh, natural capital measures? 
Um, so hopefully you can see, well, if you get these comprehensive reports, it can help you sit down at the end of the year to look at the, the business performance as a whole uh, and look at your business in the same way as you might assess it from a financial perspective. You can now assess it from a, a natural capital perspective in a complementary way. And of course, trends over time are important around things like ground cover and um, carbon emissions and, and a range of other things. It's not just a dot point. It's about trends over time and the direction of the trend. You can use this information internally for your own business benefit or satisfaction. But what we're finding is people are really starting to use this information externally for their marketing and, and communications and even starting to look at the development of new enterprise opportunities uh, and supporting a story. Um, and I think as we're starting to see now, new markets are starting to open up for natural capital around things like ecosystem services and biodiversity. In fact, I was just saw today, the federal government's got a, a tender out for uh, biodiversity um, stewardship payments. And you know, doing a natural capital report is a great way of finding out how you would sit in terms of eligibility for some of those uh, new enterprises and, and business streams. If we measure the performance of a farm's natural capital comprehensively, we can now more effectively manage for it. And of course, it does complement what's going on financially on the farm. So just going down to the next level now, if you're interested on that uh, link down the bottom there on the walmart.com, there are four really comprehensive natural capital reports. Um, Lana is one of them uh, on the website there. Um, Michael Taylor, the Taylor family farm, um, Taylor's Run uh, at Kentucky is another one uh, in your sort of reasonable local area. And there's two others as well. So you can read about them and drill down into far more detail than what I can provide today. Um, but in terms of the Lana report, what we found when we did the natural capital report uh, about 12 months, 18 months ago now on Lana, um, in terms of the ecosystem services, they scored high, uh, moderate or low across those 12 criteria and Lana ranked high across all of those 12 criteria. We looked at and we modeled the uh, sequestration net, the whole farm carbon balance on Lana and Lana is capturing 9,452 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent per year on average. And I think that was over the five year period. Lana emits 2,473 tonnes on average, but it also captures 11,900 odd. So the net was about 9,452. And over time, over the 13 years that we could go back, um, Lana, the ground cover remained above 90% and peaked at 100%. And we can look at that in terms of what happened over the district. Uh, and we put a 10K radius around Lana and you can see the differences of where it sits above that sort of local district average. Drilling down even further into the report, here are the ecosystem services, provisioning, regulating and habitat. And you can see they're scored. And um, up here uh, on the, the radar chart, the high, medium or moderate and low scores are there. And you can see Lana sits high on all of those 12 criteria. And someone like Rachel goes out with a clipboard and looks at things and scores and ticks that thing. And at the end of the day, the scores are looked at and assigned a, a high, moderate or low score. I'd like to also put down here, I've just put in, that um, the greenhouse gas emissions for Lana were 28.4 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent per kilogram of greasy wool over that five year average. Now that's a really important figure for the wool industry because they wanna know what the emissions are of their wool that they're buying because they've got a whole chain that they wanna offset and they wanna plug this information in to look at a lot of um, brands are now looking at carbon neutral. Well, they can use this figure, it's in demand to know that. Um, and in the study, I think it raised, uh, it varied from something like 26 uh, kilograms of CO2 equivalents up to about 60 in that uh, study of 11. So we were quite, you know, that's the first time we've done that. And there's quite a range of CO2 equivalents per kilogram of wool. So that's obviously creating a lot of thought and a lot of, well, how do we impact that? Here's the ground cover chart for Lana. 
And you can see here's Lana over that sort of uh, 13 year period. And here's that sort of 10 kilometer local or district type average of ground cover over that time. And this is a picture that we can start to build up on the natural capital uh, accounting report. So folks, I, that's a, uh, I've just got a, a short period of time left, but I just wanted to give you an idea of what a natural capital accounting report is. Uh, it measures the health of the environment comprehensively using a standard set of standards. We've got entry level, sort of medium level and more advanced level. And at the end of the day, it gives you a comprehensive and full view uh, of, of the health of your farm. And that, uh, using that, you can look at trends over time and you can also start to assess and bring that in for a wider sort of view of what is profit and how your farm's gone over that, that year. I'll just close with a little uh, statement that, uh, that Tim has made um, there. And, and the way we see it in, in holistic management is farmers are managing a whole, a whole farm business. So that's why we look at environmental performance as a whole. Um, and you know the segments that Judy and Tim have spoken about, about things like the water cycle and biodiversity and carbon and things like that, they all go up to it. But what uh, they all add up to it, they're segments of the Mandarin. But what natural capital accounting does is it, it looks at the Mandarin, if you like, and then breaks it into the segments so that you have an overall and comprehensive view um, of the, the performance of your environment from a natural capital perspective. And the aim is that it's information that helps you as, as farm managers and decision makers to better manage your farm business. And, Hopefully it expands the view of what is profit, um, not just financial now, but we can look at natural capital. And of course we can look at farmer wellbeing uh, as well as that to give an even uh, sort of further view of that. So Rachel, that's a, that's a quick summary of my report, <laughs> of, of uh, my talk there. The reports can be found on that uh, Walmart website if anyone's really interested. And uh, also they sum up on the AWI uh, wool.com uh, site too that you can really look at there's a lot of pictures and some very good graphs and tables and far more detailed information than what I can present. So Rachel that's it from me happy to answer any questions. Fantastic. Oh, is that me or you? I'm not sure what's happening with my sound. Okay, that's better. Thanks, Mark. Perfectly timed. That's beautiful. Uh, that link I will actually copy into the chat soon. Um, now, yeah, so if there's any questions, I'll I'll try and hopefully I can see a raised hand, but Alex or Karen will help me see anyone that I missed. So any questions for Mark? And we will actually have another question session at the end um, that's kind of can be general for Judy, Mark and Tim. But yes, uh, welcome any questions now. Um, Rachel, I've just got a question, which uh, I'm thinking others might have as well. Uh, for Mark, what is the, what's the typical um, or ballpark cost of getting a set of natural capital accounts done for your farm? Um, well, look, I think, you know, I, I, I sort of, that sort of three layer version, Karen, um, you know, we're trying to get that sort of entry level um, sort of um, carbon footprinting and, and net farm carbon around about that 15 to 1800 dollars a year um, but if you want to go right through to that full natural capital you know with the bells and whistles it's quite expensive because you've got to get um, ecologists and soil people and birdos and you know I don't know but it's probably around about 15 or twenty thousand dollars by the time you do all of that so you've got to have a really good reason to want to do that that full natural capital accounts and some folks do um, but and that medium level is probably going to sit somewhere in between. So, you know, I think that that's just ballpark. I think it depends where you are and complexity, but, you know, it's, it's a rough idea. Is it fair to say, Mark, that so we're currently doing that Latrobe University project, the 50 farms, and we're learning a lot from that. And at the end of yes. that, we're likely to have much more of an idea. Would oh, that be very much. Very much so, Rachel. So we've done, as our little group of integrated futures, we've done 11 case studies, um, which were the New South Wales, Vic and Tassie. And through the Latrobe project, we've now got 50 farms. And that's a really big project. It's fantastic. We've got a lot of research horsepower into it. You know, we're looking at soils. 
Uh, and how do you describe the health of soils? You reckon it'd be easy, but it's not. You know, and at the end of it, I think it's gonna help us be more efficient and effective. And I think, you know, the more we do this, the more we understand, the more shortcuts we can find, the cheaper, hopefully, we can make it for, for fa at farm use. So, um, yeah, but uh, we'll develop our, our methodologies even further through that. So, um, and some folks here on the call are involved in, in that study in the Armadale area too. Uh, are there any other questions? I've got one question in the chat box that I'll ask in a moment. Has anyone else got a question to mark at the moment? You might just have to unmute yourself and speak up. I think I can't see any raised hands. No, nope. okay, so there's a question mark or you might be able to see it in the chat box. Someone's asked how the 80% value in the land oh. towards profit, I assume, was calculated. Righto, I'll just clarify that. Um, when, when you look at a typical farm benchmarking project, and that figure came from Homes and Sackett, they say that 80% of the farm's asset base is held up in the farm lands itself. So when they look at the assets and liabilities, 80% of the farm's wealth is the land. So what I was saying on that one, Catherine, is it makes perfect sense. We actually measure the health of that large asset. You know, it's financially so important. Is it healthy? Is it getting better or is it getting worse? Health, in my mind, of, of the farm asset goes right to the heart of the capacity to keep producing generationally. You know, if the health is improving, then it's a great outlook for the intergenerational family business. I think if the health is declining, then I think we're going to have higher costs. But over time, in the medium term, you know, what's the capacity to be able to sustain families intergenerationally over time from that asset base? So, yeah, that, that value of the land is come out of sort of traditional farm benchmarking financial studies that 80% of the assets are the land. The rest is plant, machinery, livestock and other bits and pieces. Thanks, Mark. Uh, I think that's it for questions. Karen, can you see any other questions being Rachel. hand raised? Yes. Um, sorry, it's Keith here. I just had one yeah. more question for Mark. Um, once the uh, the full report is done, yep. uh, what happens then? And is there a demand for um, this information going forward? And if you had any um, done any bigger deals with um, like biodiversity offsets based on this work that's that's being done? Yes, Keith, that's, that's, a, that's a ripper of a question because um, from the 11 AWI case studies that we finished not long ago, a number of those farms have used that information in discussing and, and brokering deals with their, their wool brokers and, and brands, some direct, uh, some indirect. And if you were to pop on to Kingston uh, or, or MJ Bale, um, you know, it's public knowledge that they have been paid $100,000 a year uh, to sustain that natural capital uh, of that farm. And certainly the report we produced was a big part of being able to do that. Not the only part by any means, but it provided valuable information to that uh, brand that says, wow, this wool coming off Kingston is very special. And I think um, I know a couple of the other growers that have used their reports have, have done really well with their selling their wool because that report provides a wonderful empirical basis to tell and support the story that they have sort of, you know, from a qualitative point of view. Now it's backed up by quite a comprehensive report. So, and people are using it in a whole range of different ways. So, you know, I think we're just, just scratching the surface of the possibility of how do we use these reports from a, a business benefit and creating new income streams. And to me, I find that very exciting. And, and just what we want, recognition for you folks for doing a, a job well done. Thanks, Mark. Great. Thanks, Keith and Mark. Um, righto, I have just popped the link in the chat box where anyone wants to grab that. So that's to the AWI studies. Uh, I'm just, we've got four just very short videos, a couple of minutes each of Lana. That, so Tim's put them together for us. So I'll just run through those. Actually, I think there are five. Um, a minute or two each. 
And so we'll, we'll run through those. Then Karen's going to take over for a little session and then we'll wrap up with some questions, another kind of broader question and answer session. So I'll pop the videos on now. Just bear with me for a moment. Uh, find them. On the right one. So what we're looking at here is uh, a piece of Himalayan salt. You can see by the little indents in the salt that, uh, how much they've licked at it. And I've just moved it into this little that the area there where there's a small grass. But as we go back, this is where it was, and that's two days of uh, activity. And um, so what we're looking at here is uh, a piece of Himalayan salt. And you can see by the little indents in the salt that, uh, how much they've licked at it. And I've just moved it into this little that, the area there where there's a small grass. But as we go back, this is where it was. And that's two days of uh, activity. And um, that's what we call uh, uh, edible impact. And you can use the, use the salt as a, as a means through through the uh, hoof action and the animals being around it to disturb that little area a little bit. And by the time the stock come back here, that particular area will be healthy and uh, much better than and um, new regeneration of, of grasses. Um, and this, while we're looking at it at this time of year, we've got um, uh, Poa tussock, which is green looking there and the Poa is a native perennial, uh, cool season perennial. And there's more of it about here. And it likes, it seems to grow best. And there's some um, another seedling trees here. Um, but the power, uh, the stock do eat it. And uh, it's it's all part of the, uh, the diversity of, of the natives at the end of winter. Great, there's another one to come. So what we're looking at here is an older gully that's being uh, it's healed itself um, through the tree the uh, combination of mainly uh, rest and recovery that's allowed this area not to not to um, to erode and you can see the trees that are growing up through it they've been left as they've fallen um, this particular one here has fallen right across the creek and eventually it'll drop down into it and not a creek, it's just a sand, sandy gully um, that was formed hundreds of probably years ago. Um, and the water is just trickling through there now. It's got the uh, carex holding the soil, very sandy soil, so we don't disturb that. Um, and there's new trees with the roots uh, coming down to hold as well. Um, and as I look up through the timber there, you may see uh, two donkeys. Uh, with ewes and lambs in behind. So we're lambing in this area. Um, it's uh, early August and the donkeys help protect the, uh, the ewes from, the, from, from foxes. We don't have a, a wild dog issue, but they would keep them away as well. Um, and two donkeys to uh, probably uh, four or 500 ewes, or at the moment there's only about 300 in this mob. And that's more of an ideal mob for moving uh, and the ewes and lambs, they drift. Uh, when we move, when I move, I just open the gate and let them do their own thing. So they may stay for a couple of days longer, but that's that's irrelevant when it comes to, to lambing. Cause you know, with merinos in particular, the last thing you want to do is push them through a gate. Yeah, that's another one to Tim prepared earlier. So we've got here just a uh, simple uh, water trough system and all gravity fed from a header tank up on the hill up through there. But it's uh, when I put this in, it was about it's we're going to talk about paddock design as well as water design because 
here we have um, five paddocks sort of watering on this on this trough, and I've also got a gate on the gateways. I've got a as you see a little a tag with a number, and um, that the different colour got a yellow tag on it indicates the um, different the boundary between the different farmlets. So we know uh, what number we're going into next. But the main thing with this is the uh, with this water is that the, it's only a 12 foot opening. So the stock come in, they have their drink and then they get out. They don't sit around in a big corral. Um, so this, and I've watered up to uh, 80 head of cattle on this on this particular trough. No problem at all. Um, which might seem um, seem a little bit far fetched, but it, but it works. And if you've got a high flow flow rate, so we've got an inch and a half um, inlet going in, and so the flow rate comes in quick. The stock get the water, and it's good clean river water that, that there's solar pumped up to header tanks, and uh, that's and and it works works well that way. And the recovery phase. Uh, stage at this this time of year, um, the stock will won't be coming back in here um, for another month and a half. It's still in recovery phase, even though it might, might look fresh and ready to go. Um, and I'm not really in favour of designing the uh, trough so it's too narrow coming in. The stock like to get in and get and then just walk out. The, a narrow point going into a water trough system and they tend to pressure it more. And so uh, the bigger the opening, the better, the better it works. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, oh. Now, hopefully these in some way make up for us not being able to go out to Lana for the day. There's just two more short ones. So what we're going to talk about is uh, tree re regeneration. And this is all part of biodiversity. So what we've got here is a new seedling here, another one there, and the, and that's about just germinated in the last uh, few months. Another one across the other side of the gully, which was eroding through here. And it's got pinrush and um, lady grass, whatever, holding the, this side of the gully just here. But beyond there, you see different phases of different stages as well of growth of trees. So the next one up from these little seedlings is the ones that were germinated 12 months ago. And they are up through the, the, uh, the bulk of the trees through there, through the, through the segment. And then you look up higher, you see trees higher again, which were would have germinated. old dead tree here, uh, the dead stringy bark, which is the hollows in it for the bird life. And but the, what we're looking at is a range of different species, not just one type of tree. And though the range of species is specific to the soil type. So where we're standing is in sandy type soil. Further up we get more, there's the red gum, clay sort of soil, then there's box. And when you get up to the right to the ridge, you'll go back up to stringy. Um, but those trees are indicative of soil type, and they're telling us that, that that's what we need to. That's what's meant to be here. So this country, you could say, is more biodiverse. It's biodiverse in the sense that it's got the, in the terms of uh, tree regeneration, and none of this has been planted. That's not my intention to ever do that. Won't come unless you've got good ground cover. It's an indicator of a healthy water cycle. Right, and there's a lucky last. So we're on the Rumula Creek uh, headwaters, headwaters to the Guaida system, and um, a very important part of the whole wider Murray Darling Basin, really. So the Rumala um, running through this property 
is um, pretty well banked, covered. The banks are covered by what we see across the across the water there, and that's where particularly the um, we have it has platypus in here and um, bell's turtle, the endangered bell's turtle. Now, the biggest problem, as I've been led to believe, is the bell's turtle eggs get attacked by foxes. So um, if you have the ground cover and you have water and uh, grass cover going down to the water's edge, the turtle can lay its eggs without the predators like foxes coming in and taking those eggs. And also we've just been through a uh, very wet winter. Uh, we've had three major floods through here and there's, uh, you could say there's virtually no scouring at all of the riverbanks. Um, so that's a really important part of the uh, health of the river. And that's largely due to the fact that the, the whole, this, uh, the creeks are part of the whole and um, they are in recovery mode, just like all the rest of the paddocks on the property. So um, this is a result of uh, a long uh, planned grazing approach. So we're on the Rimmela Creek, uh, headwaters, headwaters to the Guayada system. Just and um, to stop it. a very important part of the whole Guayada Murray Darling Basin, really. So the Rumala. Oh, um, okay, <laughs> sorry, slight technical hitch there. Righto, that's um, that's it for the presentation. So I'll just hand over to Karen Zirkler. Karen's going to run a, um, a short session about key learnings where you get to share a few of the things that have been of interest to you. Uh, that's just very short. And then we'll have a final uh, question and answer before we close for the day. So thank you very much to Judy, Tim and Mark. It's not quite over for you yet. Um, and I'll hand over to Karen for now. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, Karen Zirkler from Southern New England Land Care, working alongside Rachel and Struan and others. Um, I just, we just, uh, this, this uh, um, day has been funded through the National Land Care Program and as part of uh, the grant application, we're a little bit obliged to um, uh, do some evaluation. But in order to make that evaluation really useful for this session, we thought we would just do 10 minutes in some small breakout groups um, where we pair you up randomly. Uh, you'll get to meet someone new or maybe an old friend. Um, and we just want you to um, spend a few minutes having a quick chat. Um, we'd like you obviously introduce yourselves um, and have a five minute chat about what was your key learning so far from what you've seen today? And second part of the question is, how might it influence your operation? Um, or how might it influence what, you're, what you do? Because not all of us here today might have an, a, a grazing operation. So the question is, what was your key learning so far? And how might it influence your operation or whatever it is you do? Um, We'd like you to record your insights into the chat box. So down the bottom of your screen, if you hover over with your mouse, you will see that you've got a little chat icon. If you switch that on, you will be able to type stuff into the chat box and then that can be captured um, in the recording of the overall. So um, we'll give you just a few minutes. So don't uh, dilly dally, you know, make sure each other gets a turn. And we'll then close off the chat, the, the, the small groups, uh, the breakout groups, and you'll return back to this main screen, um, at which time we'll get you to just share a couple of things. Uh, this is going to be pretty quick. And it will also, the other advantage of this is that it's going to help you to sort of maybe figure out what might be some of the questions that you have for the panel in the closing session. Um, so I've just got to find the, I'm about to um, send you off into breakout rooms. How many, how many people have we got, Rachel, all together? I think it was 25 30. now, or that's including us. How many? 25 at the moment, including us. Okay, so I'm going to create 12 breakout rooms and I will just um, 
assign them automatically. So you're not going to get a choice of who you meet up with. And here we go. If anyone's on their own, left on their own, I think, Strew, and you might be left on your own. So that might be okay. Hang on. <laughs> Maybe I have to do it. No, no, it's it's happening. Um, it's just happening a bit slowly, I think. Is everyone finding that, that yeah, they, people seem to be disappearing off my screens. Oh, okay. I'm assuming they're going off to their breakout rooms. And I will type the... I'll type the question into the chat so that they can all see that. Is everyone finding that they're get, making it into a breakout room? No, and there's eight participants left. Whether they've gone into breakout rooms, I'm not sure. No, I don't know. It's... um. Hang on, I might... um. I think some people have left, possibly. Some people have gone in to rooms. Others are left. I'm just adding the um, the singles into uh, into some rooms. Jill seems to be on her own, so I'll move you, Jill, to... Sure, let's keep going. Uh, Tim, I'm not sure where you're... I'm not sure what's happening, actually. It's a bit weird. No, I see, yeah, yeah. Not because Tim's a co-host. Maybe it is. And it seems but to be the co-hosts that are um Mark. Mark should still be there. No, Mark's gone in and he's I'm gonna move Mark into um room 10, maybe. Here we go. Huh? <laughs> um <laughs> Can you help me out here, Rachel? So if you see anybody on their own. Struan um, on her Struan's own. Struan's on her own, but I'll, I'll move Struan to. Tim room. Wright says he's not joined. Right, that's weird. Yeah, well, Tim's sitting there on his own, but. Um, Brian Welberg. Rachel, I, I was on room one on my own. Right. You're on your own, Richard. Okay, hang on. I'll see where I can. I can move you to somewhere. Um, how about room, gosh, room six. There you go. Bye-bye. No, I, yeah, <laughs> I don't know whether Brian Welberg and Graham Marchant are still there. Yeah, so I don't know what's got, because Richard says Richard's not joined either and Tim Wright's not joined. It's weird. I, so I don't know. Um, I think I've just sent Richard off to his room and he's now frozen. So I'm assuming he's going off to his room. Um, Graham, where are you, Graham? Anyway, uh, there'll probably be people coming back with, you know, I suddenly disappeared out of my room. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. It normally yeah. works quite well. Um, I better just put the question into the chat. So, um, Mm. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not very helpful with that. I'll just go, I can go visit the rooms um, so that I'll just pop into a couple of rooms and make sure they're okay. Um, and I suppose... Tim into room nine? Yeah, if you can, that would be good. Oh, yeah, 
There you go, Tim. It says you're not joined for some reason. And Karen, it says, Karen, it says you're not joined as well. So I don't know why that is. Is that me? Some, no, no, sorry, Karen Wright. Some, some, um, some setting must be on, I don't know. Brian, Brian and in room three, Brian Welberg and Graham Marchant haven't gone into that. Perhaps they're not there at the moment for some reason. I don't know, sorry. I think we just have a breather, Tim. Yep. I don't know whether we've lost people or not. Ms. Drewin. Hi there. Um, I asked to be excluded just from the breakout rooms, but I ended up in one. So anyway, mid-conversation, yeah. <laughs> I don't think we can be heard in the breakout rooms, can we? Um, Shouldn't be. I don't know. Well... There's a few people in this room. Oh, no, no trouble. <laughs> anyway, well done, Rachel. And yeah, it's amazing. It was great to hear Judy and Tim and Mark, you know, really, yeah, yeah really informative. I've got lots of notes. So Everyone's questions. They're always good. Yeah, I I had struggled with questions. I probably need to sleep on things for a while and then just let it mull over and then something might come to me. But yeah, I'm happy just to let it, you know, yeah. <laughs> immerse myself in it and yeah. No, I think it's good. I don't know whether we've lost quite a few people at this stage. Oh, yeah, lots of people don't want to do these things, I've noticed. So plus it's a long, longish session. Yeah. It is, yeah. It's lunchtime, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Not sure what time we're coming back. One time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Time. Rachel, apologies from Dad. Um, he forgot to bring his cord for his computer. So he's watched the end of it just on mine. Oh, but, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but I've sent him the Survey Monkey leak and I'm requiring him to do that tonight. <laughs> I can hear objections in the background. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I might mute myself just in case something gets said. <laughs> uh, good job, Tim. Okay. Could I suggest that, thanks, um, that we just do it as one, make it easier now and get, move on? Just oh, do it as one minute. group. It's a minute left. Right. I haven't got control of it. Okay. It's a, requ a requirement of the funding. Okay. <laughs> right. Treat it as one room rather than... Yeah. Well, it, I think because there's not many people left, that would have been better in hindsight. Yeah. But we can't interrupt it now. I'll just send Karen a message. Thank you. 
Oh no, there's quite a few people still left on. That's all right. They're closing in 45 seconds, Tim. You'd be happy to know. They're coming back in in 45 seconds. Okay. All right. I let them go for a, a oh. week longer just because, um, yeah, some of them are in groups of three now um, rather than pairs. Um, cool. I'm nearly done. So, um, Rachel, when people come back, are you okay? I'll just sort of get get some of the groups to just share a couple of insights. Not everybody, but just just a few yeah, just ones. Yeah. And you can type them into the chat box. Yeah. And then I'll hand back over to you yeah. for the Q&A. Here we go. Everybody's coming back. Welcome back, everyone. I think we've nearly got us all back now. Just give it a few more seconds. Repopulating the screen. Thank you. How was that? Um, I hope it was uh, enjoyable having a chat cool. with a couple of people. Um, just before I hand back to Rachel for the panel Q&A session where you get to ask any final questions of the whole, uh, all of the speakers today. Is there, are, are there any um, of the small groups that just met who would like to just share a key insight or a key learning um, with the rest of us? What did you come up with? And I'm not gonna ask every group to share, just if you've got one that you think was stood out uh, and you'd like to share it with a bigger group, just you know, hit us with it now. Yeah, well, well, I'm Arlene and uh, Ben made the comment in our group that uh, we're always transitioning. <laughs> and, and I thought that was brilliant. I thought, yes, <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Arlene. That's a great share. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, Helen, I'd just like to share the value of it. Like it's the value of sharing this information to a wider audience. Like we had students, I, I don't have land, but it's that really important thing of connectivity between where our food comes from, stewardship of the land and, you know, the way that uh, our urban centres function and council operations. I just think that's really, really valuable to, to share that across uh, between different people. Thanks. Thank you very much, Helen. That was, um, that was great. And William Hughes, I know you wanted to share something. Would you like to go next? You'll just have to unmute yourself, William. Um, I'm fascinated by the um, complexity of the, the kind of environmental accounting. Uh, but what I, I can't get my head around is what units of measurement do you use to arrive at a conclusion? And do you compare farm A with farm B and say, well, this one, because he's done a better job, he's worth an extra couple of million or something like that. I'm not sure quite how we go about measuring it. That's a great observation. Thank you. Um, and that, that might be something that others have in their minds as well. Can I suggest that that's probably a fantastic question to start off our general Q&A with? Um, mm -hmm. So we will uh, hold on to that one. Uh, maybe Rachel could write that down as a, as a question mm -hmm. for the Q&A. Oh. Are there any other observations from that, the small group chat? that you would like to share, Keith? Karen, we, um, there was Mark, Gordon and myself and um, uh, raised a couple of different points that um, Gordon made a really good point about um, you've got to be financially viable um, as the basis for your enterprise. Um, so whatever you do with your natural assets accounting um, and running your enterprise, it has to be, you know, moving forward in into the long term. Um, I was very happy to see the blending and over the last 10 years we've been looking at blending the, um, the natural assets with production assets. If we've got no natural asset we won't have production assets. And then also um, the well-being of people was brought up and that's part of living within nature not external to it. And the last point was um, we've, we do a lot of talking about different programs and, and methodologies. Uh, one thing that isn't raised as 
a, uh, a prominent thing is time. And we all need time. The ecosystem needs time to repair. And, you know, um, allowing that time for our enterprises and ourselves to, um, to come up with the outcomes that we need is something that we all need to, um, to look at more fully. Thank you. Great, fantastic observations. Thank you, Keith. That's um, well-rounded. Um, any other final ones before I hand back over to Rachel just to roll with the general Q&A for the panel? I think that's probably it, Rachel. So back over to you. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Karen. Um, thanks everyone for staying around. I think a few people have, have, have had to leave for lunch and to do jobs and stuff. But um, yeah, so we'll just wrap up for like uh, 10 minutes or so, or however long we are around that amount of time, just for a final few questions, just open up more broadly to the panel. So we already have one from William, uh, but so perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll open up for, for two questions first and then we'll come to that one, William. Um, sure. So yeah, so if anyone has a question for either Judy, Mark or Tim, uh, either raise your hand with the raise hand icon or if you can't be seen with that, then <laughs> out. Krishna. Krishna, go ahead. Yeah, g'day. I think this is probably a question for Judy and Tim. Um, so in terms of, I know in the New England, I'm not from here, but coming here, it strikes me that over at the end of summer, there's so much growth and it's very hard to use all that growth in terms of in livestock. So it kind of just sits there. And then uh, when you're going into the next season, it seems like a lot of the next season's grass can't come up through that um, dead material. Um, so through your planned grazing and what Judy and Tim were talking about, is that something you try and address? And what, what are some strategies to address that? Um, shall I shall I go first, Tim? <laughs> okay, Jude. Yeah. <laughs> so the, basically, it's a, it's a really good question, Krishna, and it's a really it's a common issue, and um, and certainly uh, that is where the grazing plan comes in. And so you would have noticed that graph that that Tim put up in terms of the um, open season and the closed season. So essentially, you're managing through the summer to build up enough feed to utilize through the winter and so that you're grazing through the winter is setting up your pastures for optimal growth through the subsequent summer so um and and that is really the the critical component of the of the grazing plan um so that you can actually effectively plan the grazing so that you you're not coming out of that winter with that with that big bank of um of dry feed and your pastures are in optimal condition so so you're actually aiming to get down to your minimum residual herbage mass targets um, around about the time that you expect growth to start. So, and that's why, um, I mean, historically, we we always used to uh, advise on about 1500 kilograms of dry matter coming into the spring, but um, just with the, the variable seasons now, um, I've tended to up the ante so that, you know, if you aim for 2,000 kilograms of dry matter at the end of the, the winter and into the spring, then you've got that drought reserve in, in hand. So that's really the, the basic principle of the, of the grazing plan. Take it Thanks. away, Kim. <laughs> Thanks, Judy. Yeah. you want to add anything, uh, uh, Got Arlene, you um, add anything, Tim? Yeah, yeah, just, just, just to add... Uh, um, a little extra on this one and that is and I didn't really realize it until I uh, read a book um, which was written many years ago by Manuka Fukuoka a Japanese biological farmer back in the uh, 50s and he talks about thatching and it's a great little book One Straw Revolution it's mm -hmm. called and um, it's really about how he thatches he, he lets all his um, rice grass and whatever just thatch down and so there's, it's, it's how we perceive the land, how we read it. Um, I'm not worried at all about having extra grass, even though it looks like in some places on, that, on the videos, it may look like there was some places coming out of winter, it will look less than what's needed where the stock had been. Um, and other places there's more, but that's just, that's just nature. And, and so I just like to see it thatched down in its own way. And particularly when you're looking at a 
diversity of cool season and warm season grasses. Um, as one drug goes down, like the Elemis scabra, the cool season perennial is up and it's thriving and it's growing straight through all that de dry debris, you know, which might appear to be, you know, this thing about having to have 100% sort of green leaf, I, 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 don't, I don't go along with that. I think you've got to have a balance of, um, of dead and green as well. Um, and that also helps the diet. So that's my, that's my side to it. Great. Thanks, Tim. Good question. Um, now, we've got a question. Arlene wants to ask a question, and I'm mindful of keeping time for Williams, and we're due to finish at 1.30, so we're pretty much on track. So, Arlene, um, go. Uh, this go is ahead. a question to you, Tim, and it's further about um, the grazing management. On that graph, you were talking about the open season and the closed season. Do you do, you do anything different between those two seasons with your grazing? Or are they the same? Um, yes. or, or, or you just carry on regardless, you know? Uh, can you just expand yes. that a bit? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah, it's a good point because it, it, it varies from minute to minute of the year, not even day to day. Um, like, and that, in other words, what goes on today will be different tomorrow. Um, and if you're, you know, if you take that sort of perception, you're always adjusting your rest period and your grazing time. Um, or recovery period, whichever way you want to look at it. But it's, it, there's no hard and fast rule about that. And, and um, so as you get drier, you generally slow it down a little bit. And as it grows quicker, like now we're coming into spring, you can move things, you can move forward uh, or you can bring more stock on, whatever you want to do. Um, at, at the moment, it's a natural increase. So we have extra lamb sitting in the ground, calves sitting in the ground. And so that's making use of that extra extra growth that's, that's happening naturally. So. But it, it's a flexible, great. It's very flexible. There's nothing rigid about it at all. I hope that answers it. Yeah. Lovely. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Arlene. Uh, righto. So William has asked a very a big question, I would say, <laughs> in the breakout rooms, and I'm going to hand it to Mark to start with. And Mark, you may anyway. I'll leave it to you to start, and then if you need my help, that's okay. Um, not mandatory though. Fascinated, William is fascinated by the complexity of the environmental accounting and wants to know what units of measurements, etc., and how we go about measuring it. Huge question. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good question too. So may, maybe the sort of simple farm consultant version is that if you look at, if you remember that slide where there's sort of six on that natural capital accounting report, sort of six lumps of things you could report on, Things like ecosystem services, um, you know, uh, Rachel from her research uh, and from the body of research uh, will will choose maybe a score sheet that's appropriate to that environment and score it, and, and so that's a way in which the output could be simply presented as high, medium, low type stuff. If you look at the carbon, you actually uh, for that particular measure the uh, CO2 equivalence is the measure that's used there. And so each of those measures will often have units associated with them. Um, and, you know, so, so there's not one measure, if you like, William, that goes across all of them. Each of those six domains has a different measure and output. Um, the way in which they're measured, uh, as much as possible, links back into published research. So if um, we're looking at the ecosystem type uh, and, and the extent and its condition, it goes into, for this work, into the grassy woodlands work, which is, is published by Sue McIntyre and others, where, where, where things can be assessed and scored. Again, they might be high, medium, low, um, or it depends what's being measured. Um, so I think there's no one unit. It's depend what you measure is the unit in which it's measured. Sometimes it's it's a qualitative, sometimes it's quantitative. Um, there is some work in the Latrobe project starting to move around, well, starting to put an index on that. So instead of high, medium, low, it might be 60 or 30 or you know, something like that, which is a, a whole bit of research in itself. But that's some very clever people in that La Trobe University project, uh, oh, sorry, uh, are just starting to look at that. And then the next project on, which we're working on now, we'll, we'll delve into that in far greater detail. So that's a bit down the track. Um, but when we look at measuring things in, in agriculture, sometimes we measure them physically, like 
number of bales at the start of the year on hand of wool and number of bales at the end. Um, some things are in dollars, uh, but, but not everything. So as we run our farms, we have different methods of, of measuring things, either numbers or dollars, as it is with natural capital accounting. And sometimes it's high, medium, low. So I, I don't know if that's a really general, if you, if you want to know more specifics, Rachel is probably the one that really can delve into you. Well, how do you score, uh, you know, um, ecosystem um, outputs? Yeah, uh, um, she's got the methodology around that, uh, if you like, of, of how you do it. And you can pop on to the AWI case studies and you will see the actual tables, if you like, that, that makes that some of that information that I presented and you can delve into that. Some of those reports are about 45 pages. So there's lots of info and the references that reference how, how and why they're measured are also in behind each of those reports. So, you know, it goes from the sort of science into the practical, into the on-farm measure, into the report. I think that's probably enough, Rachel. I probably, yeah, it's I, don't, I, hope I, just, I hope that was reasonably accurate. Yeah, they are very complex and there's no one single measure at the moment, probably likely won't be. Uh, Alec, we've got time for one last quick question before we close and I see Alex has got her hand raised. So go for it, Alex. Uh, thank you, Raj. Um, mine's not so much a question, it's more just a comment and it's for Mark from my gardener. Um, Mark, look, I, I really appreciated your presentation on um, natural, uh, account. Sorry, I'm losing my words. But in recent days, I attended another seminar on the same. It was too academic, and it completely lost me. And I'm, I'm, a, you know, a very basic layperson with a, a small property. But good luck with your endeavours and your team, because uh, I certainly got a much better understanding today of the big picture. I, I come from a Hawkesbury background. And so to me, it was all about Colby and cycle. You might as well have been, been um, talking what Richard Borden used to tell us about the rich picture and soft systems and hard systems. So it made a lot of sense. So um, yeah, I hope we get more presentations from you. Thanks. Great. Right. Helen, I think we're gonna to have to wrap up. You wanna pop it in the chat button and I can catch it, capture it. You say, can we have the overheads, that's all. Over here. Oh, yeah, yeah, we can get them. Well, I'm, I'm Mark, I'm pretty sure Mark. Oh, it sounds like you've Sorry. just muted, right? <laughs> I got all flustered there. Um, yes, I'm pretty sure that Mark was happy to share his, and I'll check with Judy and Tim, I, um, and we'll get uh, presentations out. Uh, thanks, Alex, for that feedback. That's really good to hear that positive message from you. Um, thank you very much to Mark and Judy and Tim uh, and for bearing with us through all these various iterations. Thanks to, well, I can't blame drought, but I can, can blame COVID and floods. <laughs> and finally, we've got there. It would have been nice to get out to Lana, but it just wasn't possible this time around. Um, and I also want to acknowledge, uh, just in closing, Karen's already mentioned that this was funded by the National Land Care Program, a round of events about mustering our members for climate change challenges. And I think what Judy and Tim have talked about particularly is very relevant to a changing climate. And my take home, I think, from the day is Judy's upping the 1,500 kilograms a hectare of residual to 2,000 kilograms a hectare um, yeah, that's kind of interesting that she's, uh, yeah, kind of mentioned that a few couple of times. So, hey, Rachel. Yes. Um, can I just um, let everyone know that we've recently republished Judy and Lewis's pasture checklist book. So if you want a new copy of that, we've got them at the office. And we also have copies of the pin rush grazing trials that um, Judy and Christine were involved with years ago, if you want a copy of that. Um, publication as well. So just thanks. <laughs> thanks for remembering about that, Struan. Uh, and sorry. Yeah, I was just going to mention the um, evaluation questionnaire, Rachel, to save you doing it. I've just put a link in the oh, chat box there. If everyone wouldn't mind doing that, it really it's a two minute or less uh, questionnaire. Just it really helps us to make events better in the future. Um, 
so we'd appreciate it very much thank you and just before we go i'm just going to pop that the links to the natural capital accounting um website for people to capture that as well uh now karen i need to capture the chat but i can't actually see how but anyway I'll do that. That. um excellent thank you everyone thank you very much for your time i i hope everyone's doing well in these very strange times we're all a bit over it <laughs> um and but i guess we're looking forward to a beautiful season ahead with all this um lovely rain we've had thanks again to mark judy and tim and yeah go Thanks well everyone well. thank you very much guys and bye for now bye i'll stay on current to make sure i catch it thanks tim um stop recording are you there karen if i hit stop recording i'm not going to lose it am i no i just say stop recording and you you should be fine i'll stay here for a moment maybe struan might as well although she's probably already gone no, I think, oh, she might have gone.